to the Ever Knight! Hail to the Dark Lord! Hail to the Withered Spirit of Autumn! This is the orb we ponder upon with grim books, music of the sorrows, and more in the midst of magic and mayhem. I am Lord Egregious of the Slight Darkness, and this is my show. Subscribe, or be bound to the abyss! Teehee, this is the Sawin episode. Mwah! The orb commands I speak of tomes written in the deepest gloom of delights macabre and sinister. Let us begin! The Long Nights is a wonderful urban fantasy written by a dynamite talent from my hometown of Apex, North Carolina. Author Tom Mock has real chops for crafting together narrative voice and atmosphere, creating a tight thriller within a neo-noir setting that is paced to keep the reader chasing the vampire's victims into the night. Starring the paranormal detective Joe Kellerman, this novel's hero is plagued by a power of telepathy so sincerely rendered to the function of mystery and suspense that our tour through Carthage City is enthralling. Seeking out the victims of the vampire Adrian Lang never feels forced or contrived for the sake of the story, but is lovingly wrought so you see how Joe's power yields itself to the investigation instead of merely solving it by rote exercise. This is a very good mystery which blends its genre elements well, and there's a reason it is performed highly during 2022's self-publishing fantasy blog-off. I'm pleased that for the first time on Pondering the Orb, our selection will actually be read by the author themselves. Please welcome Tom Mock as he reads from The Long Nights. The elevator smelled of piss and rattled in the shaft as we went up. I leaned against the side of the elevator, holding the bar to support some of my weight. You stubbed your toe or something? Medic asked me. That's exactly right. I could feel him staring at me. He reached out and gave my shoulder a squeeze. I winced and pulled away. You shoot straight like that? I'll manage. Well, just don't get in front of me, yeah? And don't try to wing any past me if it comes to it. You feel anything yet? Shut up and I'll have a chance. He looked up at the climbing letters above the door, rhythmically clicked his tongue on his teeth, then sighed. Uh, take this, he said, unfastening a bracelet from his wrist. I said, I'm, I don't care, put it on. There's only two charges left, so try not to panic and waste it. He handed me the bracelet. It was a leather strap with a brass buckle and a series of thin chains, each fixing a brass plate onto the back of the wrist where a watch might otherwise be. The plates overlapped, one next to the other, nearly aligning the design stamped across them. Two plates rested on top of three. I put it on my left wrist. Now get your head out of your ass, Medic said, and watched the numbers above the door of the elevator. I watched the numbers, too, and tried to focus, but my breathing never slowed down. I tested my weight against my left leg, and it hurt every time. I turned my elbow, and anything quick hurt my shoulder. I didn't even try to raise it. The gun Marv had given me felt blocky and awkward in the tight shoulder rig that jammed it under my armpit compared to the sleek-handled revolver I kept in a drawer. There were advantages to this kind of gun, but I didn't think the extra bullets would matter if I only had two seconds to react. I could shoot from my hip, but it would have to be close. I hoped I didn't have to shoot. Medic started clicking again at the seventh floor, and he wiped his hands on his blue jeans. I could see the muscles in the back of his neck all the way up to where his buzz blonde hair started. He was short, but with a boxer's build, hard cold country stock. I'd seen him take an impossible amount of punishment and keep going. Still, I couldn't help wishing he was a foot taller and a hundred pounds heavier. I wished he was Janice. The door opened and Medic was through the instant he could fit. I waited, staring at the yellowed wall across from the elevator, breathing the bad air, and trying to feel something. After several seconds, the door to the elevator jerked and started to close. I put my arm in and the door rolled back, Then I pressed the stop button to lock the elevator in place, and took two limping steps into the hall.
The fluorescent lights hummed all along the hallway. Somewhere a phone was ringing. Medic was listening at a door towards the end of the hall to the left. It was like the entire floor was holding its breath. Medic knocked at the door and listened some more. From the stairs behind me, there was a distant shouting from the floor below. A man and a woman argued near the top of their lungs. I took my gun out of the holster and rested my arm in the makeshift sling of my jacket. To the right, the light in the corner of the hall was out, and there was a faint flickering beyond. The dimness in that direction seemed heavy, a warning only in my imagination, maybe, but the feeling was there. I went that way a step and a half at a time. I was watching the flickering, looking for any shadow of movement from around the corner, when a door cracked open next to me. A black boy, shorter than the height of the doorknob, peered out from the narrow opening. His round head was shaved close and his small face seemed pale. He looked down the way I was going, then back at me and shook his head. I put my finger to my lips. Guy said he heard all kinds of hell from down here, said Medic. Cop beat us by a couple of minutes, maybe. Then there was a shot. We turned the corner, and there were only three lights working along the hallway, the nearest flickering and buzzing as if it were close to shorting out. At the far end, there was a plastic table and chairs pushed against the wall, taking up half the width of the hall. One of the chairs was knocked over. Medic sucked his teeth. Well... He said under his breath and stepped to the nearest door, taking hold of the doorknob. Shh! I stopped him, and we both listened to the faint crackle of a voice. It chattered in unintelligible bursts of static, and then was silent. Medic quick stepped to a room in the middle of the hall. He touched the edge of the door, and as I came up beside him, I saw there were three deep gouges in the wood an inch apart. I took my gun in both hands. He listened at the door, then tried the knob. The latch clicked and it swung open. The room was small and dark. Directly across from the door, a thin strip of fabric hung as a makeshift curtain, flapping in front of an open window. A police officer lay on the floor in front of a sunken couch. He was on his back with his head turned aside, facing the window. His throat was gone, and the front of his uniform was torn open. His bulletproof vest split. As the door opened, his radio gave another squawk. But even this close, most of the words were insensible. The last might have been, no response. I stared hard into the dark over Medic's shoulder, but all that moved was the fabric curtain. Medic reached along the inside wall and tried a light switch, but nothing happened. He growled low in his throat and took a thin flashlight from his back pocket, never looking away from the room. He flicked the light of the flashlight back and forth. There was a galley kitchen to the right, and a nook in the corner along the same wall as the kitchen, separated from the main room by a double length of fabric hung across the opening. His medic moved the light that reflected off the shattered remains of a full-length mirror on the floor, the wooden frame of which had broken nearly in two. On a stand beside the window was an old television with a panel along the bottom for changing channels. To the left, beside the couch, was an indentation more than a hallway, with doors to a bedroom on one side and either a bathroom or a shoebox on the other. We couldn't see the bathroom door from the entryway, but the bedroom door was ajar, and there was blood on it. Medic slid into the room along the inside wall and flashed his light into the narrow kitchen and swept it back into the room his gun following the light all the time. I stepped in behind him and reached across my body to close the door. The police radio murmured from the floor. Medic nodded me to the right. He watched the bedroom door and I watched the nook as I flipped a switch in the kitchen above the low counter. The bulb over the stove blinked to life, buzzing an electric complaint. Stepping over the legs of the officer, Medic moved to the bedroom door. Someplace quiet and dark, I thought, looking at the nook beside the window. The double-over fabric hung to the ground from a bar close to the ceiling. It swayed with a breeze from the open window. As I moved towards it, the pieces of the broken mirror ground under my feet. I couldn't look down to avoid them. Anybody in here? said Medic. 
I pulled the curtain aside. A dressed mattress on the floor, a chest of drawers, a long shelf with a lamp and other clutter. Clothes hung underneath it. Two bodies. Shit! Medic's gun went off like a bomb in the small apartment, and there was a crash as he went backwards through the bathroom door. His flashlight turned through the air as the gaunt thing landed. It leapt after him with a croaking scream, but his next two shots drowned out the sound. The thing fell back from the doorway, rolling to its knees. The woman's body was stripped to the waist. Her skin was gray and her hair hung lank about her face. The eyes were red pits, and when they settled on me, they were all I could see. I fired and missed, aiming for a point below the eyes, but she was already coming, low to the ground. Another croaking scream bore down on me. I stepped back, firing at the floor where I thought she would be, and my leg gave out under me. It saved me. Instead of charging into my guts, she leapt as I fell, and I felt her claws pass before my face. The wooden bar holding up the curtain cracked as the whole arrangement came down into the nook with her. I rolled over shards of the broken mirror as the fledgling vampire thrashed and ripped the fabric apart. I was aware of things I had not had time to see before. The mouth that opened too wide. The dark, jagged teeth. Ropey blood down her chin. The long fingertips that were claws. I came around to my back and fired into the confusion. Without waiting for the result, I brought my wrist to my chest even as I fired again and thumped the clasp of the bracelet against my chest, calling for light. A blinding flash filled the room. Another scream passed over me and retreated. I blinked against the light coming from the bracelet, blazing like a star fastened to my wrist. Fucking perfect! Medic said as he crossed from the bathroom and jumped over me to the window. Hang yourself out the window, he grunted, stepping through onto a fire escape. I heard him clanking down along the metal frame as I struggled to a knee. My left leg wouldn't take any weight, but the adrenaline kept the pain from my mind. Squinting, I put my arm through the open window and, taking hold of the fire escape railing, dragged myself up and through. The light from the bracelet filled the space between the buildings, reaching full to the concrete walkway below. The fire escape spanned between this and the nearest window of the next apartment, with steps marching down from platform to platform. I saw her, halfway to the ground already, crawling upside down from railing to railing down the escape. Medic hung over the railing below and took aim. His shots ricocheted off the metal frame, echoing between the buildings. I lost sight of the vampire as it crawled under a lower platform and continued along the stairs. Medic continued down, swearing. That's when I saw Janice, running along the walk between the buildings, her coat opening behind her as she dropped her arms and ran out of it. She sprinted towards the base of the escape, the steps at the bottom of the escape screeching down on rusted springs just as another of those throat-tearing screams echoed between the buildings and Janice closed the distance. Janice cried out, and at once both voices were cut short. Medic stopped his clanking progression down and hung out over the railing. Janice! He called down. And after a tense moment, she stepped out into the walkway and held up her hand to us. Her face and hands were pale against her black clothes. Marv appeared in the window behind me, climbing out onto the escape. Where? It's all right, I was already saying. It's Janice, it's all right. Marv stood at the railing and his shoulders relaxed as he looked down. Far below, Janice shaded her eyes against the light. I remembered my gun and put it away, and my hand started shaking. With a word, I dispelled the light and it rolled back. The buildings swallowed again by the night. I'm re-releasing my short story collection, Death and Dust, in a second edition that is free to anyone and everyone who subscribes to my newsletter through the link in the descriptions. Starring the machete-welling revenant known as Conjure and the vampire lady Emma, the two undead villains wreak havoc in the frontier city of Hellskin, leaving the local populace in constant terror, until other things come creeping out of the desert. 
This action-adventure dark fantasy features a sweet romance between two gruesome undead characters I first had the honor of publishing through an anthology called The Big Bad, but afterwards I fleshed their complete tale into five stories, all of which are free through the newsletter in the description. Brought to you by Lookfar, this reading is from Death and Dust by me, J. Record. The Chase Chapter 1 An Offer and a Wager Those who remember tell stories of how my mama was a witch and how I killed my daddy. They're right about part of it. Mama did beseech evil to conceive me. The poor bastard that got the shank was her mortal lover who beat her one too many times for my taste. I never met my real father, a necromancer who left not long after they were finished making the mortal I once was. My endless days are spent in this buried temple, now a tomb for my restless spirit. Every night I watch the moon and stars wander over my open ceiling, the sad lights lost in the constant journey to nowhere. Sounds like life, doesn't it? Stone columns carved in the faces of heathen gods hold up the old beams of the roof. The bed I sleep on was a table used to cut the hearts out of sacrifices, where I was made as I am. It also serves as a sarcophagus for my mother. Black stains still color the stone. One would think the human world would have figured out that gods don't care about guts and blood. Nothing is going to save mortals from the dark. Not that that matters to me. I just do the job Mama made me for. Tonight one of them has called crawling to my home looking for help. He's a miner, dirty from the iron he digs out of the earth. Behind such earth and scents hide the stink of alcohol and stale piss. What's your name, old man, I ask? Ephraim, Mr. Conjure, he says. The circles under his eyes complete the features of a man who wasted his life on low things, on lusts and vices which yielded nothing but more waste. Yellowed teeth chatter behind his cracked lips. I could kill him before he knew what happened. Well, what the hell do you want, Ephraim? The old Mezga shaman in town said you could save my daughter, sir. Did he now? Did he tell you the price of my services? Ephraim's voice shakes. My soul when I die, sir. That's right, boy. That worth giving up for your little girl? She's the only family I got. Be wrong to leave Emma to Elijah McKinn and his boys. My laugh echoes around the stone chamber. McKinn! You must be real stupid to have gotten in a mess with the Baron's descendants. Did the shaman tell you what else you needed to bring? Ephraim lays a wrapped bundle on the ground. I rise from the sarcophagus. My dead flesh stretches in the dry air of the tomb, the bones and ligaments popping from years of non-use. The cold of the desert invades my home and colors my skin to a shade of pale ash. Get out of here. The mortal flees to allow me privacy with his offering. It's always the same thing. Pants, shirt, and boots. All in a good travel bag. There are some new things. I always make sure they get me the gear of the century. This go-around, he brings me spurs, a long overcoat, and a wide-brimmed hat. The spurs jangle in the short walk back to the sacrificial altar. With a simple push, the limestone top slides to the side, revealing the real tenant of this fallen place. She looks up at me from her coffin, a bare smile, the only remnant left in the world. Mama's skull fits perfectly in my hand. I cradle it against my chest while pulling out the old iron machete she chopped roots with when I was a boy. Ephraim's brought a horse, a pitiful beast compared to what I remembered centuries ago, when one good stallion could take me from one end of the waist to the other in a single ride. This horse is so old his ribs poke out from his dappled gray hide. When I pass the threshold of the tomb, I feel it, the pool of my trapped soul starting to drain away. Two feather-top fetishes sit in the corners of the doorway. They preserve me when I'm in my home, but there's a catch. If I'm gone too long, my immortality wears away and lets in mortal sensations. Exhaustion and pain. If both break, death takes me. Can't touch them with my hands either, as it also causes instant death. Thankfully, the only other person who knows this is Mama, and she's not telling anyone. I brush past Efren. Please save her! The mortal grabs my arm. Please save my Emma! Humans in desperation. I grab his wrist and twist until tendons pop. He falls to one knee and screams. Never touch me. 
The horse whinnies as I drag myself into the saddle. Above me, the southern sky sings its moonless song. Stars cast their pale light to turn the desert into a sea of pure white. And I can see the cityscape of Hellskin, twenty miles to the east, its outline breaking the indigo backdrop of the night. Hours later, I ride in, covered in the grit from the dunes. Before Hellskin, the Mezca lived in the hills around what used to be a barren patch of dirt. They pulled meager crops from the sand as they cut pueblos out of the rock. Not long after the Torsi marched out of the verdant north to crush their cousins, the white Helmlanders came across the sea to assert a new supremacy with their iron swords and better-made bows backed with sinew. Out of these invasions this town grew, a festering sore of mortal failure funded by the mines. Those holes still feed the misery of this arid land. It's past midnight. The only people out are the ones up to no good. Whores infest street corners while their hustlers watch from the alleys. You looking for a good time, honey? One asks as I stride by. She's dark-skinned, probably the descendant of a slave brought over the sea from Jute, where Mama came from. Too many hard nights have made her gaunt, leaving nothing tempting. Sugar, I'm looking for a great time. This city is too cheap to keep torches lit in the street, so she can't see my rotting face. I follow her into an alley across the town's main road. Her man meets us in the shadows, his hand tucked behind to grab the knife in his belt. Hey, fella! The machete slides out of my coat sleeve. I stab with such force that gore bubbles out of his mouth. The whore runs, her screams breaking the tense silence of the streets as I pull Mama's skull out of the bag. Pressing against the man's pale forehead, I say the words I have memorized since my mortal childhood. Stay, stay, stay awake. Death not take you for my sake. He hacks up a clot before a groan escapes his bloody lips. The spell slows the process, but only for so long. He sees the machete skewering his guts, and a scream works its way out of his mouth. I twist the blade around. It doesn't hurt, but he doesn't know that. Tears leak from the corners of his eyes. Where's Elijah McKinn, I asked. Lips a-quiver. He looks from me to the machete and back. Confusion plays in his dulled eyes, and he speaks in a hoarse whisper. The vampire. I cock my head to the side. The McKins are wealthy mining barons who moved into this town centuries ago. Their favorite son Elijah, an educated speculator, built Hell's skin into a rich mecca of the ore trade it is today. I never figured he'd be around. We've run into each other once before over business. Didn't end well for him. My hope of dealing with a snot-nosed descendant dwindles. Where is he? Under City Hall. The mayor keeps the town guard from cutting in on his operations, and McKen keeps the money from coming in so the rich live fat. I yank the machete out of his stomach and he's gone, hurtling into whatever void he's destined to go. Feet patter on the filthy ground behind me. I turn and see the whore and her ugly friends in the mouth of the alleyway. I show them my red-stained blade. A mixture of fear and guilty elation stake them in place. Good. Whores always know more than their hustlers. Hellskin City Hall is a damned fortress. Sandstone pillars support a grand roof and green gardens thrive in the constant heat, hidden behind thick walls of red stone. Other buildings around it crumble while it reaches high into the starry night. Men dressed in navy blue coats walk along the flat top of the barrier while eight guards crowd the front gate. They carry halberds on their shoulder, and a few have bows. Hey, fellow, one of the guards calls out as I walk toward the entrance. Slow down. I pull the machete from the folds of my coat. Whoa, buddy, you don't want to do anything you'll regret, the guard warns. The others flank him as we meet, their faces caught in expressions of disbelief and disgust as my appearance is revealed in full. As their leader reaches out, I jerk him forward, gutting him. The others freeze, unsure of what to do as I hold the body up. I pull the machete out and time the swing as the first fool moves. His head goes flying. Chaos erupts as I weave through the guards, hacking them down. The point of a halberd stabs through my thigh, its barb a dull pressure in my dead flesh. 
I push my machete forward into the culprit's face. An arrow strikes my shoulder, the first of a brief rain falling from the archers on the walls. Men fall about me like timber, their bodies open in ragged chasms. The archers flee when they realize no arrow will stop me, which is good considering the pincushion they're making of me. One shaft is easy to carry, ten as well, but thirty or forty and all the iron wood gets heavy. I get lucky and take only one to the neck and three to the chest. No one comes to meet me once I'm past the gate. The inside of City Hall is lavish and gaudy. Gold leaf trims the floorboards while lacquered hardwood scented in linseed oil run into darkened hallways. Crimson walls hold up ceilings recently painted in murals of gods and beasts caught in epic scenes of struggle. Reliefs of Hellskin's mining history hang on those walls in the untouched spots, framed in gold and pearl. For an old mining baron like McKinn, it fits. It takes a good while to find the stairs down to the converted dungeons. Opening a door at the bottom reveals a large room of equal decor to those above. Against the back wall is a long bar. The shelves behind the smooth counter lined it with a myriad of alcohol. Around the wooden tables, the creatures of the night play card games, tossing their drunken blood dolls back and forth as they celebrate and curse Luck's favor. There are twenty-one of the bloodsuckers. More than I thought there would be. They notice me. Their emerald stares focus on the arrows sticking out of my chest and neck before shifting down to the bloody weapon in my hand. I focus on the one not gawking at me. He spins around on his stool in front of the counter. Dressed in a linen shirt and a pair of black pants tucked into his polished boots, the blonde man flashes a fanged smile. Gods and glories, he calls out in a low drawl. Conjure, is that you? I tip my hat. McKinn, the Baron, forever trapped in his mid-thirties, slides off his stool. The hobnail soles of his boots clack against the ground. My, my, it has been a long time. That it has. He chuckles, irreverent as ever. You'll have to forgive me for not remembering how long. Immortality in the same place has that effect. It was three hundred years ago when I first laid eyes on this pampered thug. Even then, McKinn had that pompous grin, but as I stare at his handsome face, it is hard to disagree. That it does. The other vampires tense in their seats. No more bets are placed, and the two drain girls slump to the floor. His posse aren't willowy humans. They're monsters just like me, fast and powerful. I reach up and pull out the arrows in my chest and neck. The flesh around the wounds tear without a hint of pain. More than a few flinch as each fletched shaft falls to the ground with a gross thud. McKinn clicks his tongue at me. Doesn't faze him. Still running errands for that old cult god of yours. Where's the girl? I'm afraid you're going to have to be more specific. I have lots of girls. I keep my machete by my side, right out in the open. Efren's daughter. Where is she? His cocksure smile fades. What do you want with Emma? Her father made a deal to get her back. I'm fit to meet my end of it. Look at you, Conjure. I think you're hardly fit to meet anyone's deal. McKen leans back on the counter and snaps his fingers. A wrinkled mortal shuffles over and pours brown liquor into a small glass. Care for a drink, he asks. The girl, McKen. You think you can walk into my home and simply take something that's not yours? I'm not in the business of thinking. I'm in the business of doing. Some of the vampires rise. I don't even grant them a glance. You remember the last time you crossed me, McKen? You remember what I did to those miners who raped those Mezca girls? Oh, I do, Conjure. I hope you enjoyed their souls. But I was human then. These boys here aren't miners. Why don't you put down that hog knife of yours and have a drink with me like gentlemen do these days? Why don't you bring me that girl before I cut your head off? McKen waves a finger at me. I'm beginning to take umbrage with your baron, sir. The old days where you just walk in and get your way because of how big and bad you are don't work in this new age of civility. Manners are a must. He downs the liquor in one gulp before wiping his mouth with a dark handkerchief from his pants pocket. I'm too much of a gentleman these days to simply let this devolve into violence. I'll give her up on one condition, and that is... I can't have you come out of your tomb and interfere with my business every time someone dislikes a deal I make, especially when it involves my girl. It was unfortunate the first time our businesses had to intertwine, but this is different, so I offer you a rather 
bloodless proposition. There are 21 vampires, a narrow staircase behind me, and no sun to stop them if I make it outside. Go on. As you most likely know, the Torsi used to gamble over slaves in a very simple manner. They'd send a representative to claim a hostage on the condition they could get them back to their territory. If they survive the chase, that is. If you can get Emma back to your tomb before we can reclaim her, then I'll dissolve the deal I struck with Efren to do away with his debts. I'll even give you a fresh horse. But, ah, if I win, you never come back to this town. Not for any business, not for any soul. This town's mine, and I have a civilization to expand. You stay in your hole. I look around the room. I can take five vampires, but twenty plus McKinn is suicide. The son of a bitch has me. He smirks at the odds. What do you say, Conja? To truly bring together horror and fantasy, we must look at one of its cardinal voices. Carl Edward Wagner was a southern author and editor of Sword and Sorcery who not only helped codify and restore original editions of Robert E. Howard's Conan, but captivated fans with his mystic swordsman and anti-hero, the wonderful character of Cain. For this episode, we're going to read a bit from one of my favorite KEW tales, taken from the Glans edition of Nightwinds. Enjoy a true master of voice and atmosphere who had the ability to craft a sorcerer unlike any that came before or after. Walk into the darkness of Cain. This is from Carl Edward Wagner's Night Winds. This is taken from the story Undertow, and we will be reading from Chapter 1, Seekers in the Night. There. He heard the sound again. Malvercell left off his disgruntled contemplation of the near-empty wine bottle and stealthily came to his feet. The captain of the Tob was alone in his cabin, and the hour was late. For hours, the only sounds close at hand had been the slap of the waves on the barnacle tall, the creak of the cordage, and the dull thud of the caravel's aged timbers against the quay. Then had come a soft footfall, a muffled fumbling among the deck gear outside his half-open door too loud for rats. A thief, then? Grimly, Malversal unseathed his heavy cutlass and caught up a lantern. He cat-footed onto the deck, reflecting bitterly over his worthless crew. From cook to first mate, they had deserted his ship a few days before, angered over wages months unpaid. An unseasonable squall had forced him to jettison most of their cargo of copper ingots, and the Tob had limped into the harbor of Cossetier with shredded sails, a cracked mainmast, a dozen new leaks from wrenched timbers, and the rest of her worn fittings in no better shape. Instead of the expected wealth, the decimated cargo had brought in barely enough capital to cover the expenses of refitting. Marvisol argued that, until refitted, the Tob was unseaworthy, and that once repairs were complete, another cargo could be found, somehow and then wages long in arrears could be paid, with a bonus for patient loyalty. Had one of them returned to carry out? Marvisol hunched his thick shoulders and hefted the cutlass. The master of the top had never run from a brawl, much less a sneak thief or a slinking assassin. Night skies of autumn were bright over Castle Tall, making the lantern almost unneeded. Marvisol surveyed the soft shadows of the Carvisol's deck, his brown eyes narrowed and alert beneath shaggy brows but he heard the low sobbing almost at once, so there was no need to prowl about the deck. He strode quickly to the mound of torn sails and rigging at the far rail. All right, come out of that, he rumbled, beckoning the tip of his blade into the half-seen figure crouched against the rail. The sobbing choked in the silence. Marvisol prodded the canvas with an impatient boot. Out of there, damn it, he repeated. The canvas gave a wriggle and a pair of sandaled feet backed out, followed by bare legs and rounded hips that strained against the bunched fabric of her gown. Malversal pursed his lips thoughtfully as the girl emerged and stood before him. There were no tears in the eyes that met his gaze. The aristocratic face was defiant, although the flared nostrils and tightly pressed lips hinted that her defiance was a mask. Nervous fingers smoothed the silken gown and adjusted her cloak of dark brown wool. Inside, Malversal gestured with his cutlass to the lighted cabin. I wasn't doing anything, she protested. Looking for something to steal? I'm not a thief. We'll talk inside. He nudged her forward, and sullenly she complied. Following her through the door, Marvisol locked it behind him and replaced the lantern. Returning the cutlass to its scabbard, 
He dropped back into his chair and contemplated his discovery. I'm no thief, she repeated, fidgeting with the fastenings of her cloak. No, he decided she probably wasn't. Not that there was much aboard a decrepit caravel like the Tob to attract a thief. But why had she crept aboard? She was a harlot, he assumed. What other business drew a girl of her beauty alone into the night of Carousel's waterfront? And she was beautiful, he noted with growing surprise. A tangle of loosely bound red hair fell over her shoulders and framed a face whose pale skin and classic beauty was enhanced rather than flawed by a dust of freckles across her thin bridge nose. Eyes of startling green gazed at him with a defiance that seemed somehow haunted. She was tall, willowy. Before she settled the dark cloak about her shoulders, he noted the high, conical breasts and softly rounded figure beneath the clinging gown of green silk. An emerald of good quality graced her hand, and about her neck she wore a wide collar of dark leather and red silk from which glinted a larger emerald. No, thought Marbasol, again revising his judgment. She was too lovely, her garments too costly for the quality of street tart who plied these waters. His bewilderment deepened. Why were you on board then, he demanded in a manner less abrupt. Her eyes darted about the cabin. I don't know, she returned. Marvisol grunted in vexation. Were you trying to stow away? She responded with a small shrug. I suppose so. The sea captain gave a snort and drew his stocky frame erect. Then you're a damn fool, or must think I'm one. Stow away in a battered old warrior like the Taub, when there's clearly no cargo to put in the sea, and any eye can see the damn ships being refitted. Why, that ring you're wearing would book passage to any port you care to see, and on a first-class vessel, and to wander the streets at this hour. Well, maybe that's your business, and maybe you aren't careful of your trade, but there's scum along these waterfront dives that would slit a wench's throat as soon as pay her. Vol, I've been in port three days and four nights, and already I've heard talk of enough depraved murderers of pretty girls like you to— Will you stop it, she hissed in a tight voice. Slumping into the cabin's one chair, she propped her elbow into the rough table and jammed her fists against her forehead. Rusted tresses tumbled over her face like a veil, so that Marvisol could not read the emotions etched there. In the hollow of the cloak's parted folds, her breast trembled with a quick pounding of her heart. Sighing, he drained the last of the wine into his mug and pushed the pewter vessel toward the girl. There was another bottle in his cupboard. Rising, he drew it out along with another cup. She was carefully sipping from the pro-offered mug when he resumed his place. Look, what's your name? he asked her. She paused so tensely before replying. Desolin. The name meant nothing to Marvisol, although as the tension waxed and receded from her bearing, he understood that she had been concerned that her name would bring recognition. Marvisol smoothed his trim brown beard. There was a rough and ready toughness about his face that belied the fact he had not quite reached thirty winters, and women liked to tell him his rugged features were handsome. His left ear, badly scarred in a tavern brawl, gave him some concern, but it lay hidden beneath the unruly mass of his hair. Well, Desolind, he grinned, my name's Marmasol, and this is my ship, and if you're worried about finding a place, you can spend the night here. There was dread on her face. I can't. Marvisol frowned, thinking he had been snubbed, and started to make an angry retort. I dare not stay here too long, Desolin interposed, fear glowing in her eyes. Marvisol made an exasperated grimace. Girl, you sneaked aboard my ship like a thief, but I'm inclined to forget your trespassing. Now, my cabin's cozy. Girls tell me I'm a pleasant companion, and I'm generous with my coin. So why wander off into the night? where in the first filthy alley some pox junk is going to take for free what I'm willing to pay for. You don't understand. Very plainly, I don't. He watched her fidget with the pewter mug for a moment, then added pointedly, Besides, you can hide here. By the gods, I wish I could, she cried out. If only I could hide from him. Brows knit in puzzlement. Marvisol listened to the strangled sobs that rose muffled through the tasseled auburn mane. He had not expected so unsettling a response to his probe. Thinking that every effort to penetrate the mystery surrounding Desolin only left him further in the dark, he measured out another portion of wine, 
and wondered if he should apologize for something. I suppose that's why I did it, she was mumbling. I was able to slip away for a short while. So I walked to the shore, and I saw all the ships poised for flight along the harbor, and I thought, how wonderful to be free like that, to step aboard some strange ship, and to sail into the night to some unknown land, where he could never find me. To be free! Oh, I knew I could never escape him like that, but still, when I walked by your ship, I wanted to try. I thought I could go through the motions, pretend I was escaping him. Only I know there is no escape from Cain. Cain! Marvisol breathed a curse. Anger towards the girl's tormentor that had started to flare with him abruptly shuddered under the chill blast of fear. Cain, even to a stranger of Karlistal, greatest city of mankind's dawn, that name evoked the specter of terror. A thousand tales were whispered of Cain, even in this city of sorcery, where the lost knowledge of pre-human earth had been recovered to forge man's stolen civilization. Cain was a figure of awe and mystery. Despite uncounted tales of strange and disturbing nature, almost nothing was known for certain of the man save for the generations his tower brooded over Kasratal. There he followed the secret paths along which his dark genius led him, and the hand of Cain was rarely seen, though it was often felt in the fairs of Karsotal. Brothers sorcerers and masters of power tempora alike spoke his name with dread, and those who dared to make him an enemy seldom were given long to repent their audacity. "'Are you Cain's woman?' he blurted out. Her voice was bitter. "'So Cain would have it.' his mistress, his possession. Once, though, I was my own woman, before I was fool enough to let Cain draw me into his web. Can't you leave him? Leave this city? You don't know the power Cain commands. Who would risk his anger to help me? Maversal squared his shoulders. I owe no allegiance to Cain, nor to his minions in Karsatal. This ship may be weathered and leaky, but she's mine, and I sell her where I please. If you're set on, fear twisted her face. Don't, she gasped. Don't even hit this to me. You can't realize what power came. What was that? Marvisol tensed. From the night sounded the soft buffeting of great leathery wings. Claws scraped against the timbers of the deck outside. Suddenly, the lantern flame seemed to shrink and waver. Shadow fell deep within the cabin. He's missed me, Deslin moaned. He sent it to bring me back. His belly cold, Marvisol drew his cutlass and turned swiftly towards the door. The lamp flames were no more than a dying blue gleam. Beyond the door, a shuffling weight caused a loosened plank to groan Dolly. No, please, she cried in desperation. There's nothing you can do. Stay back from the door. Hey, looking for more great spooky fantasy? My friend J.D. Blackrose has a new book out. Check out Samhain's Bargain from Bellbridge Books, wherever books are sold, or in the link below. Hear the strains of the damned calling from beyond! Beyond! This song is by the dark synth necromancer. Hark! Funeral director! It was always you!
Beneath the scion lights in the sinking hell of Miami, this band from Buenos Aires will bring us to Melancholia. This song of victory and triumph is by In Element.
Parliament has a new album out. Check out Victory Defeat wherever you buy or listen to music in the links below. From the chaos of indie publishing, I summon an archdemon of power and perception. I call forth the Lord of Falstaff books. I summon John G. Hartness. Warning, this video contains kitty cats. To the cloud. Recording in progress. She gotcha. sounds so, uh... What's it doesn't the have the passion of Siri. It doesn't have the no, no, not at all. No. Uh, I've been doing all so, right. I finally finished my most recent bubble book yesterday. So I am nice. taking to, I took today off from writing and, and from editing because I finished the first round on Mikey Mason's book yesterday. So turn, sent that back and um loaded the truck to go to multiverse and now so, oh go ahead so how big is a of a con is multiverse becoming for you very little i mean it's a small con it um yeah. i feel like it has potential but when they told me that they were doing bag stuffers this year they were doing 500 bags mm. okay so it, so it's a third of a con Carolinas. Right. Um, it's good for me because a lot of our authors are there. Mm -hmm. And they work really hard to get a very diverse group of guests. So it gives me an opportunity to meet new meet people from outside the region. Right. And hopefully pick up some folks I want to do business with. Excellent. So we're, we're recording. Might as well yes, start we the are. interview. It's Everyone, time to hi, ponder an orb. Everyone, welcome to Pondering the Orb. John has his orb. I, of course, have my orb, Leonard. Um, my orb is heavy. This, <laughs> your is, orb. this was my, this is a rock that Dino Hicks gave me at a con. And last year when I broke my arms, I actually used this for rehab. I would oh, sit nice. here at my desk and do curls because I couldn't straighten my arms. And right. now I can straighten uh, one of them. <laughs> Bless Dino Hicks. Such a great supporter. Oh, man, he's fantastic. Kind of but, friend kind of friend and fan we all want a million of. Absolutely. So, you know, um, we tried recording this interview beforehand, of course, there's always technical mishaps, but the first question I asked you last time, I, I'll, I'll kind of start with again. Back in December 2015, you, me, and James Gates are sitting in a bar in Duckworths, which is right off of Park Road, near Park Road Books in Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, where we came up with the idea of putting together Falstaff books. Um, all these years later, uh, twofold question. Do you have any regrets? Uh, or anything that we should apologize for and two um what has been the most unexpected thing you think to come out of the, the publisher since it was founded so that's really so that's really an interesting question um questions no there's nothing that you and jane need to apologize for um, excellent I'm a I'm a grown ass man, and I was a grown ass man seven years ago. Uh, right, I got myself into this, and every, all of the good and the bad that has gone along with running a publishing house, um, it's on me. I knew going in that it wasn't going to be easy. Mm -hmm. That said, has it been the easiest thing I've ever done? God no. No, there are also, you know, we were in year three, four. In the fourth year of the company's existence, the world ended. Yes. 
Yeah. So that was a bad time for small businesses everywhere. Um, are there pieces of running a publishing house that I don't love? Yes, absolutely. Right. I am a writer. I'm a theater nerd. I'm a gamer. That None of those things have the word accountant in them. So right. losing the majority of a week, once a quarter, calculating royalties for now over 60 authors is a pain in the ass. And I believe um, over 300 titles. Over 300 titles. Right. Now, if you'll recall that dinner, we said, I don't know, eight, maybe 12 books a year. I remember actually writing up the business plan for it. And I think at max, we had like 11. We, we had 11 yeah. ideas on the board that we were willing to go with at the time. Yep. yep. And... 300 is much larger than, well, this is your seven, so 77. Right. <laughs> it's a much well, bigger number. Um, it's interesting when you mention it because um, Kensington today bought Erewhon Books, and they're basically absorbing all of Erewhon's um, portfolio into uh, under the Kensington umbrella. Interesting. If you look, if you look at the number of books Erewhon's put out in the five plus years that's been around, like you've done that at least by a factor of uh, easily 10 times that they've probably put out 30 books and you've put out 300. <laughs> what do you attribute to Falstaff's ability to produce books of such high quality at such a rapid pace? We have a really good team. I've been incredibly fortunate with the people who want to be part of this circus. Um, when I talk to self-published authors, this is, uh, we're not on, nobody can see the video but us, but my cat just made an appearance because it's right. a Zoom call. So there must be a cat at some point. Of course. Um, Hello, Gandalf. <laughs> we, we've been really lucky. I when I'm talking to new publishers or self-published authors and they're asking how much things cost, I have to preface my conversations with I can't tell you what it will cost you. Right. Because I brought a background of business and sales to this world, which uh spoiler, most people in publishing don't have never managed people or read a contract no and we'll get into that but <laughs> go on um so when i first started working with cover artists i started negotiating so right. i started negotiating for a better price because i was planning volume and then I realized that several of my authors are very talented graphic designers and had an interest in producing covers. Then several of my authors also have editorial capabilities and an interest in picking up additional money. Mm -hmm. So most of our editorial staff and our cover design staff they also publish with us. Right. So we get a ridiculous discount. I was talking to an editor this morning who's opening up to taking on more freelance work. And I said, look, when you set your rates, make sure you're charging at least double what I pay you. Mm. Because you started working for me not knowing anything so I get the rookie rate. And we were friends before you started working for me. And I'll give you as much work as you can take. So I get the friends and family discount. I get the you don't know how to do this discount. And I get a volume discount. So I leveraged past experience to keep our prices 
our, our costs down and that allows us to produce the volume of work that we do. It also helps that we have a lot of authors who need less editorial than many. When I'm working with someone like Gail Martin or A.J. Hartley or Alex Bledsoe, and I've edited all of them, I'm not telling them how to write a book. Right. I'm not going to tell Gail Martin, who's sold over a million books worldwide and published twice as many books as I've written, how to tell a story. She knows how to do that. I'm going to, when I start working with people like those folks or David Coe or Chris Jackson or Lucy Blue, any of those people who have a ton of experience, I'm starting where a big company is on their second or third round. Right. Because I've got people who already know how to make books. You know, also, way... I do all our interior layout. So yes. that um, I spent $300 on buying interior layout software. And that has subsequently saved me tens of thousands of dollars in paying people. So this leads into my next question. You know, um, I edited for Falstaff a little bit after the founding of the company, and I remain mm -hmm. an author there. But I came up here to New York, and I did some freelance editing for some ind indie publishers and some indie authors up here. And one thing that I've always respected about you and kind of admired and adored is that you've never been um, hesitant to embrace new technology in a in an industry that seems extremely hesitant at times to kind of catch up to things like, you know, I'm doing a co-promotion for with uh, J.D. Blackrose for um, oh, yeah. Sawin's Bargain. And one thing that I'm doing it for her is a blog post where I'm talking about how Vellum is allowing me to go back and do a second edition of an ebook that I released a few years ago and do it yeah. better and make it look better. But if you talk to some of the people here in New York about Vellum, they kind of look at you like you're speaking a foreign language. Do you find when you talk to other editors, other publishers, that there really is this kind of hesitancy to embrace new technology? Or is it just that they don't know yet? Because it seems like you've always been- No, they're shit scared there. of it. Oh, okay. What? They're absolutely scared of it. Um, and it comes from growing up as readers and writers and book people and thinking thinking of technology as some kind of enemy mm -hmm. this romanticization god is that even a word whatever this tendency that writers <laughs> and people in publishing have to romanticize old things mm. is ludicrous if you want to make money in this business well yes i, I, I love to... the smell of a book too yes i have spent hours and hours wandering through bookstores too no i don't care about any of that when it comes time to figure out how to make money right i can love all of those things that doesn't help me get paid. Do you think that your attitude towards the business in terms of book production is changing with kind of the new generation that's coming in? Or do you see things up here in New York still remaining firmly kind of entrenched in this old way of thinking? I pay practically no attention to what's going on in New York because I don't give a shit. <clears throat> I think that one the bookstore distribution model is hopelessly broken and now we're from, getting into it <laughs> from the outside looking in because i don't work in new york have never worked in new york but from the outside looking in it seems that new york is hopelessly enmeshed in that old bookstore distribution model well okay, here's so... here's your clickbait bud here's your episode title 
Bookstores are obsolete and vanishing and nobody will care in 20 years. Find me a Turtles or a Blockbuster video. Right. You can't. That isn't being, that isn't being made for a Netflix show. Like, right. Yeah, absolutely. Or for, uh, a ca- or for Captain Marvel. Seriously, the most recent the most recent I've seen a blockbuster is when um, Brie Larson fell through the ceiling of one in Captain right. Marvel. Books are slow to adapt, and we have historically been behind the curve of other forms of entertainment. Part of this is the, one of the same problems that my one of my former lives, theater has we're arrogant assholes Mm. and we won't own the fact that what we do is entertainment just like a movie a tv show a cd if you're in new york Mm -hmm. this will tie in well there's a little group that started in north carolina and moved to new york and has subsequently opened venues all over the United States and toured all over the world. And they are one of the most successful performance art troops in the history of the art form. And nowhere in any of their marketing or descriptions will you find the term performance art. Mm. Because Blue Man Group don't give a shit about karen finley blue man group getting paid right so i don't care how dickens did it but by the way dickens was in it to get paid yes he was so i have to follow up with that because you you did say some i guess the this is going to be the halloween episode so (laughs) I'll, I'll work in bookstores are dead somewhere, but <laughs> talking about that, you know, New York really is still focused on this kind of bookstore distribution model that kind of favors print books, even to the detriment of like ignoring ebook sales. Sometimes what do you think the future of the print book is? Because there's this constant debate always every few years in the marketplace that, you know, print and ebooks sell at the same kind of at the same rates, but you know, with the bookstore market, model kind of falling down what is the real future of print when it comes to you know going out on amazon and doing that distribution model or or releasing wide on the other digital platforms which unfortunately don't get anywhere near the attention that the biggest one previously mentioned does oh the 800 pound gorilla that new york publishing created and nurtured and fed because they were too stupid to realize that ebooks were a mark a profitable market share and oh it didn't understand that people who commute will want to listen to books on the subway or as they drive long distances because they all live in a major metropolitan area and don't understand that people people who drive an hour each way to work every day. So they let audiobooks develop without them too. And oh, look, Amazon bought the biggest audiobook distributor. New York's to blame for the stranglehold that Amazon has on the ebook and audiobook market because Absolutely. they screwed it up. They had it and they didn't pay attention to it. And now they're suffering for it. And oh, well. Well, it, it's kind of, it's funny that we're having the Halloween episode because in many ways, New York has turned into the vampire's thrall. If, you know, if, Dra- if Amazon is Dracula, Dracula just comes around every so often and sucks some blood off, off of New York up here. And I think you see it with like the collapse of, is there really a big four anymore? Is it really just a big three or are we getting to a big two? You know, or does it's anyone very care? obvious that that too i you know one thing that constantly um i think bothers authors up here and i think bothers authors online but they don't see how it doesn't resonate outside of twitter new york is that no one's really paying attention to the death of this like it's dying and some people are paying attention to it but 
it's not getting like front row in Hollywood Reporter. It's really not being covered by CNN. It, it's yeah. something that's just coming and going. It's really, qu- in some ways, dying very quiet death. Well, it's a natural, entropy is a natural part of the universe. Um, the center cannot hold. Things fall apart. Um, industries, organizations, art forms have a lifespan. Um, and as society and people progress, the way they consume entertainment changes. We, we started without having books. We started sitting around a campfire telling stories or wearing masks and standing in theaters proclaiming our stories to audiences. We didn't start with multiple middlemen stepping on the price of the product on the way to the person who's enjoying the story, the performance, what have you. Um, But no, nobody outside of nobody outside of publishing cares that publishing is dying. And here's a here's another piece of clickbait. This is the best time to be a writer since the invention of the printing press. Absolutely. And anyone who doesn't believe that is tied to New York's publishing model in a way that either their livelihood is very tied to the New York publishing model. The word you're looking for for that is literary agents. Yes. Their livelihood is, t- is tied to that model. Or their sense of self-worth is tied to that model. We know a lot of people whose goal was not to write a book. Their goal was to have their book in a bookstore. Yes. Maybe they needed that for themselves. Maybe they needed that to prove to their um, unsupportive parents that they were a success. Maybe they needed that to show their high school English teacher that they that nobody really gives a shit about comma splices. Right. I don't even know what a comma splice really is. I have copy it's editors that thing for that. that. I'm not going to try. <laughs> <laughs> I have so- copy editors. Before we transition to you as an author, because I really want to get into that, um, kind of rounding back a bit, what do you think the value is of print books? You know, in the immediate, people clearly want print books and they're still reading print books. But, you know, if, if books, if bookstores are gone in 20 years and the main kind of distribution that everyone kind of expected the print model to exist on is gone, what do you think? the print model looks like if you had to conjecture or predict same as an album does today Mm. creator driven small runs collectible product um you can't buy an audio cassette anymore right when we were growing up that well when i start when i was growing up i started with eight tracks and then transitioned to cassettes and then transitioned to cds but you've always been able to buy an album because it's a it's a very attractive presentation the mass market paperback was never meant to be something that sat on your shelf for 10 years right it's a pulp product it was created to be disposable so the mass market paperback is a dead product and has been for half of my career at least it was dying before i ever got into this industry the hardcover and the limited edition hardcover the autographed hardcover those are always going to have a place because they are a more they're a firmer connection from the reader to the author i have I have three books on the shelf behind me that are the Grim Oak Press limited, not signed, numbered editions of Ray Feist's um, Rift War Chronicles. Magician in one yeah. volume, um, Silverthorn and Darkness at Sethanon. They're beautiful, slip-cased, 
great books. books too. Oh, I love that. I've, I've always loved that series. Yeah. I think they were 150 bucks a pop for me yeah. to buy those. Um, I didn't bat an eye. Not because I'm incredibly wealthy. I live fairly modestly. But when I want to put my money on something, I want it to be something that I will keep. So I buy hardcovers and I buy limited edition things and the it's special like collecting vinyl. Absolutely. It's exactly yeah. that. That's exactly the roadmap for what we're doing. Look right. at the record industry. Look at the film industry. Look at how they went through the death of their distribution model and the pain that went along with that because there were plenty of people who went bankrupt when Blockbuster went out of business and it wasn't just the guys who ran Blockbuster. Right. Lots of people lost lots of money, but there are a lot more indie filmmakers making a living and producing art their way now than there were 30 or 40 years ago. Right. And there are more writers making a living today than I would posit at any time in history. And I'm pretty safe to say most of that just because there were, one, there's more people in the world than at any time in history. And two, there were large chunks of time when very few writers made a living. Right. But I, I've never had a book published by New York. I support my family solely off of the sale of my books since 2015. Right. So, you know, transitioning away from discussing the business. I've always respected you because I could come to you for a worldview that is kind of set in reality, but at the same time, willing to take risks and take chance and be creative. When it comes to you as an author, you as a writer, mm -hmm. how much do you think your worldview filters into your actual work? Or are you able to put that aside and create something on its own? Because, you know, you've written so many wonderful things and, you know, we could talk about Bubba, we could talk <clears throat> about Quincy Harker. Um, we can talk about, um, God, it's just slipping my mind right now. So Southern Paranormal Mystery. Oh, Grace. Uh, yeah, Grace. Um, I... you, you have so many voices and you have so much talent, but at the same time, you're able to tell so many different stories. How much of your worldview is centered in your work versus you being able to kind of divest yourself from that and create something unique on its own? I don't really know because I can't read my work with an objective enough eye mm. to honestly know. Um, some people who have known me for years and years read some of my work today and are surprised by nothing mm. in the books. Every book that I write is going to come from me it is going to come from how i see the world the way i create books is based off of how i was raised um my process for writing a book is very workmanlike very blue collar i come from a rural blue collar background my father was a lumberjack my mother was a housekeeper and i was raised in the presbyterian church all of that is very protestant work ethic you get up you go to work you do your job you move on that's how i write too now part of that is also you do your job the very best you can. Um, there are certainly things that I've written, scenes that I've written that I was like, huh, didn't know that was in there. Mm -hmm. 
and that's fun that's the discovery that's when you let your guard down and let words flow and your characters develop along the path you've set for them but there are things to discover along that path and a lot of times you're discovering those things about yourself as much as you are about your characters how different are you as a person from the time you started writing to now and how much do you attribute that change to you know doing the work and producing those books versus just you know life always influences our work but how much do you think your books have changed you in the process of writing them i think the books have changed me very little i think that you can watch the changes in me through watching my books Mm -hmm. um i've published my first book in 2000 my first novel in 2009 so Mm -hmm. this is year 13 um in that time i have left a career behind i have left a creative expression theater where i spent god close to 30 years working in theater um And I spent 17 plus years at the same day job. I've left both of those things. Both of my parents have died since I started writing. Those things changed me. And I think that that can be seen in my work. I don't know if the work has changed me i I definitely think that because of the because of the self-examination that you have to do to write well i am different but i think that's more the act of the writing than the text itself if that makes sense i know i'm splitting hairs on some of these things but you know, it's a deep thinky question. So we're going to ponder yeah. that orb for a minute. <laughs> exactly. Well, getting into that, is there a book across your career yet that has kind of stood out to you as maybe the most difficult to write, maybe the toughest oh, yeah. to get through in terms of the process? Yeah, but oh, yeah. by all means. I mean, I can I can give you a list. I couldn't write Amazing Grace while my mother was alive. Hmm. Um. That is a Southern Gothic paranormal mystery that's set in a fictionalized version of Lockhart, South Carolina. Um, I grew up less than 10 miles from Lockhart, South Carolina. The blueprint in my head of the town is a blend of Sharon and York, South Carolina, where I went to elementary and high school. Um, My mother and her two best friends are characters in that book. That Mm. book is incredibly personal, and I couldn't tap into that. I couldn't mine that um, that field while my mother was. My mother died from dementia, which, Mm. for anyone who's gone through that, worst way to watch someone die I've ever been through. And I've watched all, and I've seen it. (laughs) I've seen some shit. Oh yeah, but my my family's getting ready to go through it too. So yeah, it's I'm I'm really sorry. It it, it is it it's just this feeling of helplessness. Like you you really can't cancer is do easier. It. Yeah, you can't cancer. You can at least fight. You can at least put up the illusion that you can fight it. And you're still yourself until almost the end. Yes, my mother died three or four times before she died, yeah. and. So I couldn't mine that chunk of my life for inspiration while she was still technically alive, even though the woman I knew and loved was long gone. Um, And so that one, it took a lot for me to get ready to write that book. Um, Probably the eighth Quincy Harker book comes a reckoning was very difficult to write um 
one, my father was dying while I was writing it. Um, mm -hmm. But also, I wrote it in 2021. We were still in a pandemic. Hell, we are still in a pandemic. Right. There was still tons of turmoil in the world. There was tons of turmoil in all of the industries I'm associated with. And the mental fatigue of the two years leading up to that made it a very hard book to get through. And I was just thinking today, actually, I was thinking today that now that I kind of know how to write a book, it's a lot harder to write a book. Right. It's a lot easier to just be completely ignorant of what you're supposed to do and sit down and type things. But when there are expectations of what you're going to turn out, that's more pressure. And you see it a lot in authors with massive debuts. You know, yeah. sophomore slump, you see it in records, you see it in actors. Um, and a lot of that comes from the fact that you've worked on your first traditionally published novel for years and years and years and polished it to a high gloss. And then you get a contract and you have to write the second book in a year. Right. So it's not going to be as clean. It's not going to be as polished. It's harder once you know what you're doing. Um, so those are a... probably Sorry. the tough, those are probably the two hardest to actually create one mm. because of emotion and one because of the world. Right. It, was there one that technically challenged you the most as a writer where you had to stop and think, holy shit, I'm being asked to do way more than I was expected to do either by my editor or by your own expectations. <laughs> yeah. Harker three and four. Hmm. The Damnation Salvation arc. For those of you who don't have the benefit of actually seeing us, which is literally anyone listening, um, that creaking is me leaning back in my chair as I look to my left to look at the bookcases along the wall. Um, Harker, when I started writing the Quincy Harker books, they were collected novellas. So I would write four novellas and put them together in a volume. And the first volume of those, they're largely unconnected. There's not really any kind of plot through line. So they're just four novellas that feature the same characters and there's character progression, but there is not a singular plot. With the second Harker volume, The Cambion Cycle, that is essentially Instead of 120,000 words spread across four novellas, that's really a 30,000 word prologue to a 90,000 word novel. Because the first of the four novellas is all flashback, and then the next three all tell one story. And that was still pretty easy. Then I screwed it all up <clears throat> because I decided that for the next two Harker books, for the next two years, I would write four novellas each year. And they would all tie together. And four of them would feature Quincy Harker as the main character. And four of them would feature other characters from that universe as the protagonist. And then I would tie it all together in the eighth and final novella and finish off this great big Marvel Secret Wars, House of M, Age of Apocalypse comic book crossover that I had created for myself. And that was hard <laughs> because I wasn't writing eight novellas. I was writing eight novellas that ended up in 220,000 word volumes that each had to have a beginning, middle, and end. And then the whole set of two 
120,000 word collections needed to have a beginning, middle, and end for the set of eight. So structurally and technically, that ended up being very difficult and way harder than I expected. I think it turned out okay. Um, yeah, I, I think they turned out great. And I actually have a follow-up question from, from that. I remember the early Bubba stories also kind of being disconnected before they, you know, they kind of thickened out into longer novellas that were far more interconnected, kind of like Harker. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, um, God, just thinking back, you didn't really tell anyone that you were really doing Harker while you were in the midst of Bubba. You, you kind of announced, I remember you just kind of bringing out Harker, like, Hey, here's Quincy Harker. And it, you know, it became this big thing right next to it. Um, when you decided to start moving away from, you know, this kind of standalone novella, this is a contained story to connecting things to larger arcs, what kind of considerations did you have to take into account when you were learning how to do that or playing with it for the first time? I just did it. You just did it? I didn't think about a damn thing. Yeah. Yeah. The thing is that I've never started a series knowing it was going to be a series. Hmm. All, all three of the series that I currently have, the Black Knight Chronicles, I wrote mm -hmm. one book. I right. saved the world at the end of book one. Yeah, you did. Don't do that, young writers. Don't save the world. Because then you have to figure, if people buy it, you have to figure out what are you doing in book two? Yeah. Um, and I'm not giving that away. I figured it out, but you'll have to write your own books to figure your way out. With Bubba, Bubba exists because I sold the Black Knight Chronicles to a mid-sized press in Memphis, and they had right of first refusal on anything in the Black Knight universe. I wanted to publish more books more quickly than they did, so I came up with unconnected intellectual property and self-published it. Bubba exists because of a contract clause. Right. So I had no idea anybody was going to read that. And it started as short stories because the because of the way Kindle Unlimited worked at the time, which wasn't based off page reads. It was based off of borrows. So right. whether anyone read it or not, you got paid when someone borrowed the book. And that led itself to being more profitable to produce shorter works more quickly. Then they changed the rules and it became way less profitable. So I switched to writing novellas because that's how I could continue to make a living. And then Harker, I wrote it because I saw that they were doing Constantine on NBC and knew that it was going to bomb because you can't drop f-bombs on network television and you can't write an effective Quincy Harker as a purely heterosexual man living in the United States and not, not say let fuck. him say fuck so right. you have to let him say fuck you really do or you can play with his sexuality. They did that well with Legends of Tomorrow. Making making Harker or showing on that show that Harker is, pan, not Harker, Constantine, Constantine. is pansexual um, just makes more sense. And it gives yes. the character more depth. So because I didn't know anything was going to be a series ever, I didn't think about it. I didn't plot out anything other than the first books ever. Then when it was time to write the next thing, well, I just sat down and, okay, well, what do I want to do now? Okay, that seems kind of cool. I'll do that. And then as they became more popular and began to really be a thing that pe that enough people were buying that I felt like, okay, I might need to clean this up and figure out where we're going and maybe map things out a little further. I still right. don't tend to map things out all that far in advance. Usually a couple of books in an arc, and that's about it. 
So would you consider yourself a plotter or a pantser? Do you outline or do yes. you just start? Okay. okay. I outline pretty religiously, actually. Okay. Uh, with a, if I'm writing a short story, my outline may be three sentences. Right. Because it's going to have inciting incident, turning point, solution. And if I can figure those three things out, I can write six or 7,000 words with a um with a novel i break it down by chapter and i write one sentence about each chapter and i write down what's going to happen so, and sometimes so, it's just talky talk sometimes literally what i write is bunch of talking <laughs> right but, so do you do you pay any attention to like the three act structure or the four act yeah. structure but yeah. how, how do you employ those and do you have a do you have a favorite structure if, if i may ask i write in a three act structure i find that for a western audience it's kind of how we're trained to mm -hmm. consume media and since that's who i'm right that's the market i'm writing for i want to follow the expectations of my customer right um I also have read um, Save the Cat. I haven't read the novel version of it. I've read the screenplay version and I kind of adapted it to work for me. But yeah, I use a three act structure where act one is about 25% of the book. Act two is usually about really about 65% of the book. And then mm. my act threes are very short. My, my act threes tend to be 15% of the book with a little tiny epilogue at the end. So you're best known for urban fantasy and, and some mm -hmm. epic fantasy, and you've also done the shingles um, work, which we'll, which we'll get into. But when it comes to um, producing your manuscript, what do you, what's your typical turnaround time? And did you have to build up to that turnaround time or have you always been able to work relatively quick? Because one thing that's been, you know, well observed throughout your career is that you put out a lot of shit and you're yeah. always working and you always have something else coming out so i'm just curious what is your real turnaround time you know you talked about short stories and novellas but if it came down to a novel or a series what are you thinking in your head when you sit down to, to get things done a novella takes me about a month okay and then a novel call it a ninety thousand word novel takes me about three months and that's me slowing down. Yeah. Um, that's 2,000 words a day for, it, with a novella, that's 2,000 words a day, five days a week for three weeks. Mm -hmm. And that gets me to 30,000 words, which is the sweet spot for my novellas. Um, that's because I have a publishing house to run and right. cats to raise. And I like to spend time with my wife and play magic. So if I can make a living selling books at 2000 words a day, then I'm going to continue to do that because I didn't leave a day job to work. Right. Like I still have a day job. Right. Of course. I work more than I ever did at a day job, but we're not going to admit that very often. <laughs> what, when you got started, were you doing 2000 words a day or so? When talk I started, about that build I didn't, up for it. For when I bit. started, I didn't know anything about working off a word count. I didn't know oh, how long okay. a book needed to be. I've always written tight, and I've always written fairly clean. This comes from the five years I worked in journalism before I moved into fiction. And that also made me fast, because mm -hmm the work I was doing was for the internet poker industry. And when there were big tournaments anywhere in the world, the company I worked for would send people there and they would watch poker hands develop and write them up into little short, not quite Twitter short, but one to two paragraph updates of what happened here. So let's say... Toby Maguire was playing in the World Series of Poker, which he has done. Yes. Um, so there would be little notices every time something big happened that with a big hand that Maguire was involved in. 
because he's the most famous guy in the room. Well, each morning after a day of action, I would get up before I went to my day job and I would consolidate all of those live updates into a 1,000 to 1,500 word article. Well, I only, had, I only had an hour to do that before I had to go to work. Right. And they were paying me really well to do that work. So I needed to be fast and I needed to, and it needed to be clean copy when I sent it in. Right. So that trained me to write in that way. And I think I'm not going to say that I'm like John Scalzi because mm -hmm. one, I'm much taller and have more hair. <laughs> Two, less money. But he and I both have that similar background in journalism. And I've, I've talked with him a few times. And he also tends to turn in tight, clean copy. And he and I both, through our careers, have had to kind of shake off the, the tight description or lack of descriptions in our work to flesh out a full novel. Um, his first works were very short for novels. Yeah, they were. But as he's progressed, his stuff has gotten bigger because he's shaken off some of that white box tendency that journalists, we, fo we focus on action. Right. And not as much on the description. There's no, there's no, Tom Bombadil traipsing through the woods in my books. That's not what I do. There's so, no time for that. No, I don't. Yeah. So I do. I I tend to write fairly quickly. Also, um, one thing to one thing to keep in mind is you've always got to be working. Yes. If you're not producing, nobody's going to remember you. Right. If you're not Pat Rothfuss or George R.R. R. Martin, most people won't care if you release the next book in your series. I would argue only one name actually endures through all. One of the two names you just mentioned actually endures through all that. And that's only because he has two successful TV shows now. Like, it, let's go, let's know, revisit this in 20 years and see if either well, of those no. names endure. I, I, but I think you're absolutely right. I think like you previously mentioned that, you know, this is the best time to be a writer and the best time to find success. But one of those things that comes with finding success in today's market is that you always, like you say, have to be producing. You always have to be working on the next book. Um, you have so much always in the Tumblr, always in your wheelhouse going. Do you have... At this point, do you have a favorite character to work on that you can fall back on and say, like, if I if I need to do something fun, I can go and do something fun with this character? Or at this point, are you just able to, like, branch off into whatever you want and just find comfort in that? Well, I mean, I love writing Bubba and Harker, and I love writing the Black Knight Chronicles books. I love writing those boys. Um one of the reasons I haven't turned in book nine, which is later than any of us care to admit, um, is because it's the last book in the series. Right. I, I'm kind of putting it off a little bit uh, because that's a big chapter of my career closing at nine books. Um, so I take my joy from not from a specific character but if i nail a scene right yeah that's what gets me i've written the prologue for harker nine i've written nothing but the prologue for harker nine but that prologue is one of the best things i've written i'm very proud of it writing the prologue told me that I didn't know enough about where I was setting the book to write the rest of the book. Mm. 
because the the ninth book is very tied to its location and while i'd been there i'd only been there for a couple of a couple of times for a few hours so i went and spent a few days there a few weeks back and took a lot of pictures took a lot of notes got the feel of the place refreshed my memories um and now that i'm done with well yeah, you're right. I got a lot of things in the hopper because I'm still probably not starting that book until January. Right. I have so, I have a novel and a novella to revise and release this year. And then I have another novel that I'm 50,000 words into that I would like to finish. I'm 50,000 words into it and I've barely I'm barely past the midpoint. So this will be the longest thing I've ever written by a long shot. What genre is it? High fantasy. Okay. Well, we'll we'll talk about it off air at some point. No, I'll um, talk about it now. I've talked okay, about it. Okay, by by all means this shows about epic fantasy, high fantasy and sword and sorcery. What do you have what are you working on? High Fantasy 7 Samurai. Oh, nice. Okay. That that reads like Nick Eames' as Kings of the Wild. That that's a great book. Um I loved it and I loved the sequel. Because yeah, but, it wasn't a direct sequel. Right. Yes. Because you can't write a sequel to that book. You can write a prequel, and I'd read the hell out of it. But you can't write a sequel. That story's over. So it's great that you brought this up because, you know, I, I write epic fantasy and sword and sorcery. I've published sword and sorcery with you. Um, you're writing a high fantasy. When you look at the genre of epic fantasy, sword and sorcery, basically, um, as I say, swords, wizards, and dragons. When you look at the state of the market in terms of how those books are doing and what you see being popular, what do you, what do you see right now that you like? What do you see that you don't like? Um, what do you think could be better? What are you maybe trying to fill in with your book? Oh, I just want one. I just, I literally want to sell one book to New York. Ah. If they want three, I'll do three. I don't have any interest in a big, in a big multi-book New York contract. I want one or two books to raise my visibility among and raise my visibility among the reading populace to make money off my backlist because that's going to pay me better in the long right. run. Also, the book I'm currently working on that is a high fantasy is a standalone. There won't be a sequel. Ah, okay. It's... There's not so, a sequel to the Seven Samurai, right? There, story's over. <laughs> correct. What went into that? What went into that thinking, though? Because you know the industry really is weighed towards kind of series, at least trilogies and um, pentologies. Yeah, that's five, right? Pentologies. Yeah, that's five. Um, wh what made you go towards standalone? Because you and I have had the conversation that you know standalones are fun to write and they're sometimes fun to sell, but they don't often sell a lot. Yeah. Um, because I'm not looking, because I'm looking for this book to be one piece of my overall publishing strategy. Right. I feel like the way, the way to be the most successful as a writer today, it's the same as building a successful novel it's a three-legged stool yeah a successful book has to have plot setting and character you don't have to have all three legs of the stool in your career but if you can self-publish some things small press publish some things and big press publish one or two things then you're dipping into a lot of paths to readers and you are meeting people in all of those different realms that all may be interested or able to help you right hello kitty daisy will not jump up on the desk on her own if i'm sitting here she will come up and pat me on the leg until i pick her up as well she's a perfect her princess status. 
as Princess yes. Daisy. Yes. yes, her her highness does not leap when the peasants such as myself might observe her in such an undignified behavior. Of course. So, you know, kind of skipping over from your high fantasy, which I'm looking forward to, um, you've also founded, along with other authors um, in the indie publishing scene, Authors and Dragons, which has become this, you know, pretty successful podcast where you play D&D um, as com- as comedic characters not badly you guys play oh, very well <laughs> there's a lot of edits we're not very good <laughs> not with the role playing part the mechanics but, of actually clicking but, things on a character sheet on a virtual tabletop that kind of thing we're awful at right Our- but being involved in that you've also you know you talked about the three legged stool of you know publishing You've also kind of added a, maybe not a fourth leg, but a new chair off to the side that you can sit in, in terms of being a content creator, where you're kind of in the same boat as I am now. We're both kind of going on YouTube and Apple and Spotify, which we'll get into when it comes to eBooks in a second. But um, what do you think of being in the D&D content space and what has you, what were your expectations when you first started Authors and Dragons versus what you guys have gotten to now? Because you guys have a con. You have the Authors and Dragons con now. Um, we made a movie. Yeah, you guys, are, and you guys are making a fucking movie, a shingles movie, which we haven't even talked about what shingles is. This disgusting fiction. This oh my God, series, it's the worst this, thing ever. It's literal blasphemy, folks. You need to go read it and buy it. It's blasphemy on pages. Just go read it. If you grew up reading Goosebumps as a child. Yes. And then graduated to playing Cards Against Humanity with your friends, then Shingles is the perfect series of comedy, horror-ish novellas for you. Because it is... lit. That's how we market it is if the people who created Cards Against Humanity wrote Goosebumps. Right. And I mean, we're unashamedly parodying Bob Stein. Um, I don't know him. um, And I hope that he doesn't know my name and can't find me. (laughs) I will say he is a very nice man, though. That is Um, what I have heard. Um, AJ knows him pretty well and offered once to make an email introduction and i said oh please don't (laughs) please no (laughs) that'd be an interesting conversation i expect it would be fine because his checks continue to clear (laughs) right but being in that content space how how do you feel you know going out there on the marketplace and not only establishing kind of not only a niche but a foothold and what kind of challenges do you guys see coming in the near future because you know content is always changing the way people are consuming it is always shifting just your general thoughts we're constantly asking ourselves those questions we're constantly asking what's next if you go back and listen to some of our earliest episodes the sound is atrocious Mm -hmm. we're yes Gandalf we're talking all over each other because we can't see one another we have whatever we have what i'm sorry there was a cat doing something strange and it took me a minute to figure out what the hell was going on if, it, um, if it's not the litter box it's chaos otherwise but yeah I, <laughs> I think she was scratching at a door right which i say she because that's very much a daisy thing um we're trying to figure out whether we're adding video for some elements, whether we're adding video for all elements, what are we doing, how are we doing it. Um, we've upgraded all of our recording technology. Interesting note, um, I'm currently talking to you on a $40 piece of crap Plantronics micro headset mic that. Um, sounds great every 
person on our podcast has replaced whatever expensive recording mic and boom and shock mount we were using with these because right. it because it just sounds better. I can run my air conditioner in my office and no one hears it on the recording because the noise canceling is designed for noisy op cube farms. So this $40 is far superior to the couple hundred dollars I spent on a Yeti and a boom arm and a shock mount and, 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 and a pop filter, all of, yeah, all of that stuff. Um, <laughs> all the stuff on my screen folks is completely Actually, out has been completely outclassed for my setup, for all of us, right? by right. this cheap headset. All this, 60 bucks, and yeah. it sounds great. And it's, it but does. that's the thing. People don't realize when it comes to content creation today, the price of the tech has been driven down so much that it's very yeah. hard not to turn out a better product if you just put a little time and effort into it. Absolutely. It's all, and it's, and it's in the edits knowing right. how to edit, knowing how to modulate, how to clip out the awfulness. Yeah. So when we started, we were very clear in our goals. We were going to do this D&D &D thing for a little while, see if any of our audiences were interested in crossing over to each other's readership, and then maybe six months or a year, and we'd call it quits. We're in year seven. Yeah. We've recorded a couple hundred episodes. We now have two different spinoff games that we also broadcast, and we have a convention every year. And we started this shingles as a monthly uh, as a monthly parody novella and we've produced nearly 60 of those things yeah there's a lot of them and we cre and then we collected five of them into a screenplay and made an indie film this summer which should be available in 2023 it's so in the can so let's talk about this film. How did it come together? I, I know you mentioned previously um, off camera that, or off mic that Steve Weatherall was, was mm -hmm. kind of a big part of it. Um, but how did this film come together? And, you know, going into the independent film space, which is, again, kind of a different thing all to itself. Oh, you know, yeah. what, what is the experience? A couple yeah, of things happened together or very close in time that allowed it to all happen. And one was an idea and someone dumb enough to go through with it. And the other was an absolutely happy accident. Once a month for our Patreon patrons, we produce an episode called Authors and Dragons at the Movies. And it's Rift Tracks, MST3K, any of those things. It's us watching a terrible movie and talking shit over it. And it's because we think we're funnier than the dialogue. And most of the time, we're correct. Also, because most of the time, the dialogue isn't intentionally funny. Well, the guys pick, and we don't always have the whole cast for these. Um, my weekend, we frequently do those on weekends, and my weekends are often taken up with traveling to a convention or a writer's conference or producing one. Um, the guys picked this movie called Caris Hell about a carousel unicorn that comes to life and begins murdering people, which sounds like it may be the worst film ever made, right? sounds terrible i mean we have we live in the era of sharknado so i've sharknado had a lot of sharknado <laughs> that's true that's true the movie was too good <laughs> none of the guys had watched the movie before they did the atm at the movies on it yeah it was too good and we all liked it 
so somebody posted a tweet that we did this movie and uh, we screwed up our recording because we liked the movie and we didn't make very many jokes. Well, the writer and director responded. Yeah. Because indie. Yeah. Well, then we brought him on and did an interview and we got to be friends with him. Steve Radzinski is the writer and director of Karis Hell. Mm-hmm. And while this relationship was developing, Steve Wetherill went back to some of his roots where he had always wanted to be a filmmaker. And he had mm. written, done some screenwriting back in the day. And he said, well, I think I want to adapt some of our shingles books into a screenplay. Does anybody care if I do this? And the, the resounding, nah, dude, go for it, <laughs> was deafening. I honestly think that it was three days later and he was probably halfway finished before I ever even saw the note. Um, because <sighs> I'm busy and yeah. shing- adapting my parody novella into a screenplay that a friend of mine who I also publish is adapting I wasn't exactly worried that he was stealing my IP, my intellectual right. property. Um, so Steve wrote it. And then he was like, well, why don't we talk to Steve Radzinski about directing this thing? I was like, wait, what? You mean we're actually going to make this movie? Yeah, I think we could. It's like, all right. So we met with Steve and he's he looked over the screenplay and gave us a developed a budget for us and then we hired him and started crowdfunding the movie and we raised close to 40 grand to produce this film which ended up being the most the highest budget he had ever had to work with so we made a movie because we didn't know we couldn't yeah that's so all right i'm gonna rewind back to god 2006 or 2007 i was at the national association of broadcasters conference in las vegas we the company i worked for exhibited there because we did a lot of work in cell in designing lighting systems and pipe grids for tv studios and corporate video studios and things like that. So we were there and my buddy who was our marketing director knew that I'm a fan of Kevin Smith and his films. And he said, hey, Kevin Smith's the keynote speaker. Uh, I have a free pass. Do you wanna go? I was like, hell yeah. The thing that stands out at me about Kevin Smith's keynote in addition to him talking about making Red State, where he would shoot all day, smoke weed and edit all night, and then go back to shoot all day. And I was like, I mean, how else do you create a film? <laughs> I, I I require sleep, <laughs> but I have not made, but I didn't make Clerks. So I'm obviously not as good at it as Kevin Smith. But the thing he said that resonated with me and obviously stuck with me some 16 or more years later. He said, surround yourself with why not people. Yeah. As opposed to people's natural inclination being to tell you why something won't work and why you can't do this, make sure that you're surrounding yourself with people who whenever you tell them, I think I'm going to adapt these five nigh-pornographic parody novellas into an indie film, and we're going to raise tens of thousands of dollars to make a movie. Surround yourself with people who will say, yeah, why not? As opposed to people who'll say, that'll never work. Right. Because for people whose reaction is always, that'll never work, they're always right. They will always be correct for the people whose reaction is, "Eh, why not? 
okay, what do you got to lose? I mean, we've all failed at things in our life. If you haven't, then I'm sorry, because your life has probably been pretty boring. What have you accomplished or what fun have you had? If you've never done anything that you look back on and think, whoo, that one could have killed me. Right. Oh boy, it's a hell of a story. Have you really lived? Well, the number that, that's... of, the number of yeah. things I've done in my life that I look back on and think, whoo, I was trying hard to climb out of the gene pool there. <laughs> How much do you think that experience is needed to be a great writer? Do you think people without that experience can put together good stories? Or do you think you need those failures in your life to find, not only just find the ability to write a good story, but maybe find your voice? Because I find that I only found my voice when I started considering really my failures and how I could get better from them. I think it's there's probably somebody out there that can do it without failure or loss or tragedy, but a good writer will be able to tap into the emotions that they're trying to have their character portray. If you've never felt grief, how do you write grief that someone who has felt that can respond can react to if you've never been absolutely terrified how can you write something that shows your character is terrified it, you know what if you've never had your heart broken do you really know love mm. because a lot of times the way that we understand things is through contrast to something that is familiar hey this feels great how do i know this feels great as opposed to this just being normal well because yesterday i stubbed my toe and that hurt this feels better right so i do feel like experience is important you can fake it. There are plenty of people out there who can fake it. I, I don't put a whole lot of stock in the concept of talent. Because I went, to, I went to school. I have a degree in theater. I've worked in the performing art. I worked in the performing arts for nearly 30 years. And now I work in publishing. I have been fortunate enough to meet and know a lot of incredibly talented people. The most talented actors that I started school with never graduated and never got paid as actors and left the art before their 21st birthday. Mm. Um, but they were talented. They right. just didn't work hard. Right. So I'd rather have somebody who will work harder than anyone else. Because I knew an actor for... I knew an actor for a long time that was not good. They weren't getting cast, or if they were getting cast in a show, it was a, a non-compensated role or an extra on a shoot. They might have been making 50 bucks a day. They were never getting speaking roles because they weren't good absolute lack of any innate talent for performance hmm. i've also never known another actor who worked that hard and this actor left charlotte about at close to 15 years ago if not more and has made a living 
as a professional actor ever since because they worked so hard for so long and got good. Right. So speaking of hard work, you know, um, I often try to, well, I, 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 I critique a lot of young authors. And one thing that I find with young authors is that there is this real kind of hesitancy to go that extra mile in terms of finding that extra depth in their voice or really finding the grit in a character or really honing in on their dialogue. When it comes to finding, if you had to put together the kind of author that you would want to work with, are you working with, kind of getting back to what you said about talent, is talent something you feel like you can develop if you have a hardworking author? Or is te- or could you teach a talented author to work hard? No, I cannot. That second bit? Yeah. The I first can't. one's easier. Yeah. Yeah. I can't teach a prodigy how to work their ass off. Right. Too often, you know, former gifted kid, stuff came too easy. Mm-hmm. I still don't know how to study. I never learned. I never had to. I had a talent for absorbing knowledge that was going to be on the test or useful. So I never learned. I never needed to. But someone who does not have that innate talent but has the drive that I can work with. I've told people ever since I began speaking in front of people, and this now makes two different careers where I've been in a position to speak to collections of young writers, collections of young actors, young technicians. If there's anything else you can do, go do that. If you can be happy doing something else, go do that. It's not that I don't want competition because other writers aren't my competition. Right. Um, I firmly do believe that a rising tide lifts all boats, that if we publish at Falstaff, we publish between 50 and 60 books a year, and a voracious reader will sometimes read 150 books in a year. Right. So I don't expect them to read my entire year's output three times. I know they're going to go read things from other presses. Doesn't hurt my bottom line. They're not competition. But when this work is hard, Hmm. any artistic, creative endeavor, anything you want to do, and be good at is going to be hard. You know, you've had multiple different sections of your life, and anything that you ever got good at was hard to get good at. Yeah. You had to work at it. Well, you know, I, I consider myself a I consider myself a pretty good writer. Yeah, it's still I do too. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Um huh. But I I pay you. So, yes. (laughs) But like, it's still hard doing this. Yeah. Especially if you want to like go from being pretty good to great. It's hard doing this. And like, I, I find often that writers I run into, especially the new ones, are often shocked by the fact that you kind of have to devote your life to this. But like, that's also kind of part and parcels of the creative arts, isn't it? Like, it really is kind of a lifetime discipline of devoting yourself to the craft. If you want to, let's pick a random job. If you want to be a mechanic, you, you enjoy fixing cars. 
you live in any medium-sized town or city in the United States or really probably anywhere, you can find work. You don't have to be the best mechanic in your city to achieve any level of success. You have to be, you can't be in the top 1% of all writers in your genre and make any money. Right. If you're in the top 1% of writers in your genre, then there's a word for those writers. That word's unpublished. Mm. We were open for submissions in the month of February of 2019. It was intentional that we were open for the month of February because it is the shortest month. Right. 28 days. Over, over 300 submissions. Mm-hmm. Two. We bought two. Less than 1% of what came in the door. And we are a very small independent publisher. We don't pay advances. We don't have much in the way of bookstore distribution. We produce great work. I would stack our books quality-wise up against anything that comes out of any press anywhere. I would too. But to get your foot in the door at one of the smallest reputable presses in the United States, because I feel like I'm fairly safe calling us a reputable press. Oh, easily. I mean, I, mean, I um, don't think sometimes, you, you know, you, you talk about how you don't care about what happens up in New York or what happens in sometimes a larger publishing sphere, but truly like there's a lot of respect for fall staff not only in terms of how you run it but in terms of the quality and you know i think one thing that the publish people don't give the publisher enough credit for is that you guys really give people a fair deal and a yeah. fair deal is incredibly hard to come by in publishing yeah um you know you've said that to me before that people who i don't know have heard of our press and i kind of laughed it off i thought uh that's very sweet jay's being very nice then i was at a con earlier this year and <laughs> i wasn't talking shit see i wasn't talking shit you weren't you weren't i thought you were just blowing sunshine up my ass nope um and i appreciated it but i was at a con and i was early for the panel and I was moderating and it was the guest of honor mm-hmm. and David Weber and me. So it was going to be a full room. And I was, while I am quite successful, I'm, I'm not a New York times bestseller. I'm not a big, I'm not David Weber. I'm not Weber. I'm not Peter Brett. Um, God, was it Peter Brett? I think it was. I don't remember. It was somebody like that. Yeah, I think it was Peter. Um, anyway, I'd never met the guest of honor. And I come in, I sit down between them. David and I have known each other for years. David was chit-chatting with one of one of his fans and going into great detail on some note in one of the honor harrington books um and we had a couple of minutes and i introduced myself said hi i'm john i'll i'll be moderating uh is there anything you specifically want me to bring up or anything you specifically want me to avoid and he was like um yeah and you know he did the thing that is completely normal especially at a small convention where you don't know most of the other people he said so what do you do i said well i write he said yeah but i mean for a living i said yeah so do i he said oh (laughs) what was your name again and i told him my full name and 
he blank, completely blank stare. Fine. I like that. <laughs> I want to be rich. I don't want to be famous. Right. Never want to be famous. Amen. Worst thing um, in the world. But then I said, yeah, I'm John Hartness. I write a few things and I run Falstaff books. He said, oh, wait, I've heard of them. I was like, oh, well, okay. Maybe record. I wish what people could see that. my smug ass face <laughs> oh. on this camera. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I wish people could see it. <laughs> oh, my God. It's horrific. But yeah. Do you, do you know how I knew that things were getting out of control and that you guys had a really big reputation? I did a search. And I think this was when I was still editing. I did a search one day. And I just typed in the Google Falstaff books. Mm -hmm. You came up on five different websites as reputable small publishers. And huh. we were only into like year two of the company at that point. And I was just sitting there like, how do these people know that we are where we are? And then I found us on Submission Grinder of all places, which is a big like site to go and you know research the huh. markets and i was I, just like where where did i didn't fill out the page you didn't fill out the page i don't think i've ever even i don't think i've been to that website in my life well it, <laughs> i should probably I check that, it out <laughs> i knew that falstaff was doing something right when it spontaneously started appearing like this and i think one of the things that you and the rest of the team at falstaff which should always be mentioned because they're so good at what they do. Um, I think you guys turn out such a great product for relatively little money where up here in New York, people will put tens of thousands of dollars into a book and it will turn out like a pile of dog shit just right there on the bookshelf. The moment you open it, like, Everything from wonky layouts to misspellings to outright gram uh, grammatical errors and editing cues that were left in. Yes. Oh, oh my god. Yeah. Yeah. No, I I was swearing about that early this year. I was reading a new book by a friend of mine, big deal writer big deal book um i was like the copy editing and pr the copy editor and proofreader for this book should never work again or maybe yeah. go back to school maybe if they go back to school they can work again but well the work that the went the work that went out the door was so far below what we consider acceptable yeah. That it would absolutely take a freelancer off of our, off of our call sheet. Well, I think one thing that should be noted, and this will be the last thing we'll say about Falstaff, because I, I know we're running out of time and I have two more questions for you. Um, you do so, as you mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, you guys do so much in-house, but at the same time, you all are relatively experienced authors most of the people in New York who are doing things like the layout and the proofing, a lot of them are college kids who yeah. haven't been taught how to do this stuff yet. They're 24 years old. They got a BA from somewhere. Then they went and paid tens of thousands of dollars for that stupid publishing industry certificate from Columbia. Is that who? Columbia. Yes, runs Columbia that University. Right, right up the street from me. Yes. Yeah. Um, feel free to piss on their front stoop at any point and tell them it's from me because that is the, that program is as bad as a vanity press because yes. it is putting a seal of approval on people that don't know how to do the work. Yes. There well, are programs out there that are respectable. Kevin J. Anderson teaches a course, teaches a program in publishing in Colorado, wherever he lives, yeah. somewhere out west. And he, it's a graduate program in publishing. And Kevin has sold a few books in his life and right. has run a press and done quite well. And 
even if he couldn't write a lick, he publishes Dune. Yeah. He does okay. He knows yeah. what he's doing. But if you have people that are training new publishing professionals and those people's only experience is tied up in a in an antiquated view of the industry then they're not going to turn out people with a contemporary view of the industry you talked and about I, what you yeah. talked earlier about new york being afraid of tech being afraid of change i came into this business at 37 right i wasn't a kid i'd had a job the reason i never hired anyone to look over a publishing contract for me is because when you've looked at a hundred million dollar construction contract a 20 grand publishing contract does not seem very intimidating. Right. And when, when it's only a few pages in, in consideration to that yeah. uh, construction contract, which are two or 300 pages long. Right. I mean, when you, the work I used to do, if we screwed it up, we could kill people. Right. Because when you drop things on people's heads from a from a great height, they tend to die. You know what happens if somebody misses a deadline in publishing? Then the book gets published later. Right. We ain't shipping kidneys, kids. <laughs> yeah. I've so, said that a lot. So I I've two more questions for you and sure. of course no thank rush. you uh thank you so much as always but yeah, happy to um when you look at publishing pre covid-19 and you look at publishing post covid-19 and you just look at the general state of the industry what do you think did anything get better or did anything get progressively worse in your opinion because one thing that i'm noticing now i think i think it's directly because of covid reducing down the economy and then of course there's a uh, there's a recession coming but here in new york and of course in la there are now like there's a huge drive to try to blame the downfall of the industry on certain things and the first thing they're going for is diversity equality uh and inclusion um practices like you know warner brothers today just ended their um writers track that would basically bring un underrepresented voices from different communities into the industry and teach them how to be writers teach them how to be screen uh teach them how to write screenplays how do you think the industry's going or where it's going to be going in the next few years post pandemic, because you're always out at the cons. You're always talking to publishers. You're always talking to authors. Um, I think that out of everyone I could ask this question to, you would probably be able to provide a more sober answer than most, because I think if you talk to most people in publishing, especially the people that work in publishing journalism, um, either everything's great or the sky's fucking falling. So for you, the sky's clearly not falling, but everything's clearly not great. What does the world look like to you when it comes to publishing? So the, the positives or one of the positives that I think that came out of quarantine, because I don't, I do think that it is an outgrowth of quarantine and people being almost forced to examine themselves more. I think awareness of lack of diversity among people that look like you and me, spoiler, mm -hmm. both white dudes. Very um, I think that the awareness of how shitty diversity and representation really is 
is a positive. Mm -hmm. I think that in the long term, publishing will have greater representation overall. I think in the short term, you can look at publishing as a microcosm of the nation and look at the pain and the growing pains that will go along with that as people who are heavily invested in an existing system and draw a lot of their image of self-worth from that existing system fight to hold on to what they think is theirs and it comes from a, a base lack of understanding of entertainment economics mm. it ain't fucking pie black panther making a billion dollars at the box office did not hurt captain marvel which did not hurt Wonder Woman, which did right. not hurt Shazam, which did not hurt Ant-Man. Note, I did not mention Justice League because no amount of societal change could have saved that dog. <laughs> you can only oh, polish... Yeah, especially now. <clears throat> Look, you can polish a turd all you want. It's still shit. Bot League of America yeah i mean it might be it might it might be shiny shit but shit's still shit yeah. i think that so many people feel like power and influence is there's a finite amount of it and if anything we've learned from this device that we're talking across and that people will use to acquire this conversation later if we've learned anything from that, it's that you can have hundreds or thousands of people influencing an industry. Mm -hmm. So I think that long term, that will be better. I think that short term, it will be more painful to get there because of the entrenched nature of people in power because they're afraid of losing money because if you're paying this writer of color a hundred thousand dollars well did that hundred thousand dollars come from this white guy no no it came from this writer of color selling a fuck ton of books right i mean the hate you give didn't hurt um the outsiders sales for stephen king oh um speaking of you know we're, we're now living in the era where books are being banned again unfortunately but they've never stopped reading... being banned yeah we they've just... never stopped being banned they've never stopped but one thing that has happened, um, I was reading an article, and I can't remember the title of the book, but it's basically the number two banned book in America. It's Gender top, queer? Yes. Um, it's top 10 at Amazon in multiple categories. So, like, even the idea of being banned today is kind of a misnomer in a little bit because you might not be able to get into the school classroom anymore or even to the university classroom but you're still able to distribute your ideas and your information and still get out there so we you gave know, away think, we gave away 200 copies of mouse this year yeah <laughs> but like i think the important thing that people need to take from this is that like books and i think if you have a good book and i think if you have a good story if you have a good product we're now living in the era where like there's very little that can stop you if you can just figure out to find you know you could just figure out the way forward very little is actually going to stop you and there's very little i think media can actually do to stop you and now i think there's pluses and minus to that you want but, the shining example of that yeah by all means chuck tingle yes those books aren't well written 
No. God bless him. I think the man's a national treasure. I adore every social media post he makes. I think he's lovely. He, I have man, no idea. I it's am, not 20 rabbits in a hat someplace. I am going to, because I have no proof to the contrary, I am going to accept his stated descriptions of himself as true. All right. Because, That's fair. because I don't care enough to spend the mental bandwidth to figure out if Chuck Tingle is really, you know, three muskrats standing on each other's shoulders in a trench coat. <laughs> um don't care this needs to become a new con game what do you think chuck tingle is oh god that's hilarious but chuck tingle writes an incredibly niche set of books and their sloppy we, photoshop covers and why don't you their... give some of the titles to the audience just just so they know what we're talking about oh god um They've gotten progressively longer. I think it started off like pounded in the butt by a dinosaur. Yes, pounded and in the butt by a T Rex. There was one that's pounded in the butt by my butt. Yes, and then then it got to pounded in the butt by my two Hugo nominations. Then pounded in the butt by the guy who bought the Wu Tang Clan album and won't let anybody read it. <laughs> Or it's pounded fantastic. in the butt by the Wu-Tang album that some schmuck bought, and now we all hate him. Um, you know, pounded in the... I, I think he even... He's done a couple that are even... Like, gently held but not pounded at all. Yeah. By, <laughs> by my, a, he, by my he asexual friend. Um, you know? But... Chuck Tingle, by his accounts, is an autistic father who writes books, but that is not something that New York is going to pick up. Right. He out earns probably all but the top 1% of New York published authors. Without ever getting an advance. I have to ask you, and I've always wanted to ask you this, and I don't think I have. You know, indie authors, first of all, there's not a lot of indie authors going out there and exactly reporting how much income they're making off of their indie products. So true. assuming that it's the same way as traditional, like there's probably, you know, there's probably a smaller number of people making money or making a living selling books on the indie market, but there's probably a lot more of them now than people in the traditional marketplace. And oh they're probably, God. Yeah. They're probably making more money than anyone on the traditional um, marketplace. I was just wondering how big do you think that disparity is? It, or it, do you know an example of how big the disparity is that might shock someone here in New York, but make someone in independent publishing go like, yeah, that, that seems like a fair number. Well, if you take a look, if you take a look at the guest list for Dragon Con, right. Let's take that as a microcosm because there's a lot of, there's a lot of successful indies at Dragon right. Con and there's some big name multi-published authors that are traditionally published i sat with a couple of friends of mine one year a few years back one of them was indie one of them was new york published and the talk turned to audiobooks and the new york published author was like yeah you know i um i do about two grand a year on my audiobooks it's nothing big and the indie and I looked at each other and our friend was like, what's that look mean? And I said, well, I'm solidly mid-list and I make two grand a month off my audio books. And I pointed over at, our, at my friend and said, and I know he does a lot more than that. And he just sat there and nodded. He said, yeah, I quit my job off my audio book sales. Yeah. Um, I have a friend who literally sold more 
audio books of his self-published novels in 2018 than I've sold across almost to to that point in time. He sold more audio books that year than I've sold in my I had sold in my career across all formats. Wow. <laughs> this is an author no this is an author that couldn't get booked at major conventions because he didn't have the name recognition in the industry. Never had an agent. So you you officiated my wedding. Yeah. You're one of my best friends. So I'm going to ask you a very selfish question. Sure. You know, you've kind of been with me at this point since the beginning of my publishing career. Um, you published one of my first stories and you've continued to publish me. Um, I don't feel like... I don't feel like I've wasted a career yet. I feel like I still have plenty to do and yeah. plenty to go. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there's always that feeling like, you know, you're stuck. Sometimes you're only going to sell this much. You're only going to appeal to that much, you know, this audience, but it seems now with, and you were a big part of my, and changing my thinking about this, especially when it came to Epic fantasy and sword and sorcery, it seems now that authors have an unlimited amount of time to make it now because of the indie world and that there's that opportunity is always there where I used to be very set in tr the traditional mindset. You know, you knew this, like I, yeah. I only had the framing of the traditional mindset until I met you. Sure. I mean, you didn't know anything else. Yeah. And I, and I came into this industry from another industry so my immediate thought upon looking at the publishing industry was well that's stupid how can i do it better right <laughs> but my selfish question basically is like do you still see potential in authors like me being able to grow more and do more and reach that next level and you of know course. it I, I've, I asked this because I read a recent article about BookScan and how BookScan has been used in the traditional industry to really kind of exit a lot of authors out of their careers where they would never get a chance again to be published because, you know, these, these publishers are going by the metrics. BookScan book book scan, book scan should be dragged out behind the woodshed and shot. Yeah. It's a useless fucking tool useless so, fucking tool when you when you're talking to authors like me who are still in their minds trying to make a career out of this and who are still pushing to be better writers but pushing to be better authors better to be better at their marketing mm -hmm. what would you tell someone like me or someone who's kind of sitting in this place feeling like i'm i feel like i'm clearly moving forward i yeah. feel like with every release i get i you know more people pick up the books more people get interested. One thing that you pushed me to do, the more I tweet about the books and the more I go out there and actually market the books and keep marketing them, even though you know they might be five years old or six years old, as long as I keep marketing them, I'm always finding new readers. I'm always building my newsletter. I'm always reaching out to new people. What would you tell authors like me? Is it just like keep grinding? Like what do so... we do? you actually said it already you said exactly what i would say to you um with every release more people pick up the book so just write the next so book. release more books write the next right. book right <laughs> God bless you. Thank God for edits. Um, yeah, that was that was a sneeze. I'm looking real quickly at um, I'm looking at my um, reader links page. 
Hard Day's Night first released in 2009. Right. By many metrics, a book that isn't a series that isn't a huge seller is done after 13 years. Well, that book made me 200 bucks last year. And that was just off Amazon eBooks. That's not what it made me through the publishing agreement I have with Bellbridge, which is unique because I kept the Amazon eBook rights right. for that book. Um, they wouldn't do that today. But that book made me 200 bucks. Is that a great big pile of money? No. But that series is eight books deep and it leads people into me. Right. So that 535 ebooks that we made that $202, $202 off of, that then sent people to Bubba, to Harker, to Grace, to the second Black Knight book. Having more product and making sure people know about your product is the deal. Can I uh, propose to you an idea that I've, so I'm going to be doing a lot of independent publishing in 2023. Good um, and, yes. And I wanted to bring this up because I have a feeling that now is the time, especially if there's a recession coming in six to nine months. One of the things that authors should be doing right now is trying to publish as much as they can, or even trying to figure out a way to publish in the midst of this recession. Because if you can somehow find a way to afford it, and I know that's a hard word for some people to hear, find a way to afford it, like surviving this is going to be a very key thing i think for a lot of authors and being able to put work out i think is going to help a lot of people make the tough transition that we're about to see i don't have any pity for the vast majority of authors who say they can't afford something because if you really can't afford it um you know netflix 15 bucks a month hulu's 15 bucks a month yeah. disney plus is 10 bucks a month you know start looking at the things that you're spending money on that you're largely ignoring what random subscriptions to random crap do you have that's costing you a few hundred dollars a year Absolutely. if you go through and turn off the subscription to the online newspaper that you signed up for and you're now paying 10 bucks a month and you read one article every two weeks well you turn that you turn off a couple hundred dollars worth of those subscriptions and then you've got enough money to buy a cover right you have enough money to get a copy editor you have enough money to get a good layout you have enough money to afford vellum or yeah scrivener or whatever you need to get the book made and i don't want to say i don't want to be one of those middle-aged guys saying oh these stupid millennials spending all their money on avocado toast no i get that it costs a lot of money to keep a roof over your ha head right now. And I also know how much money most of us waste. Yeah. I thought I was thinking about buying a car a couple of months ago. I was doing research and I was thinking, okay, well, let's see how long my truck's going to last. I currently drive a 15 year old pickup truck with over 200,000 miles on it. Um, I also really like my truck. Yeah. So I was looking around at, okay, well, I'm going to need an extra five or six grand for a down payment. So I sold off a bunch of magic cards. Because I have a pile of magic cards. I have a pile of collectibles that I can mm -hmm. offload when I need those things. So. 
you gotta want it. Yeah. Can I? You got. Can I? Ask, you gotta want it more than you want anything except family. Uh, yes. You said something earlier that kind of uh, struck me because you said it, and I wanted to like literally spring forward in the camera and be like, "Dude, yes, I get it." Um. You know, you really love writing and nailing that scene. And when you said that, like it, it, it got over with me, big baby face pop in my head, just because like, yeah, that's the fucking thing right there, isn't it? Like, if you're really into this, I feel you're willing to make those kind of small kind of creature comfort sacrifices because the feeling that you're going to get chasing that scene and trying to figure that out, you know, I... I think if you really kind of figure out how to develop a process and get the words down on paper, this becomes one of the most addictive things that you can do, especially when you find that scene. Um, how much of your day is you trying to chase that scene? Whether it's in your head, like how much are you thinking about that scene? How much are you chasing that scene? Like, I'm you know, I, right I can now. only speak for my, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I let I let my lizard brain do a lot of that work. Yeah. But yeah, uh, all the time. I'm probably only writing for a couple hours a day. Right. That's that's the other thing is the life of a professional writer isn't about writing. That's the easy part. That's the fun part. The work is the promo. The project yes. management, the production management, where ordering more inventory. Um, I just bought a computer today because yeah. I hired somebody to start doing some more admin stuff for me. Um, but I need to provide them with the tools to do that work. So I bought a Man, computer. You, you're a you're a fucking mensch. I, I can't, no, I can't stress to you the idea of you buying something for someone at Falstaff so they could get the work done. There are people in New York working at publishers right now that don't have fucking bathrooms. They don't have fucking bathrooms, let alone like iPads and shit like that. Then the so people like, who are running those companies are assholes and should not be allowed uh, to manage people. I, you know, one of the things that, uh, and you, you kind of brought it up, but when I first moved here and you mentioned the, you know, we've mentioned the Columbia uh, publishing certificate course, but one thing that I notice in the industry is there's a real pay disparity, I think, when it comes to like the actual inner office, like, you know, your copy editors, your, your copy editors, your line editors, your proofreaders, all of that, you know, you're expected to come here to New York and make 30, 35 to 38 with no insurance living in Manhattan. You can't um, live in Charlotte for that. Yeah. When you look at some of the woes that these larger publishers have, what do you think is their biggest weakness besides not being able to move with the technology? <laughs> Leadership. Okay. Could, could you expand on that a little bit? Um. Publishing being run, literally yeah. a cat just jumped up onto the back of my chair from the Hi, floor. <laughs> hey, buddy. Um, publishing is either run by book people who don't know shit about business or business people who don't know shit about books. Right. There aren't a whole lot of people who know both and nobody seems to be trying to train those people so the people you have in leadership don't know enough to change it and fix it and <clears throat> nobody being willing to burn it down and start over is why it's all burning down. Well, I have to ask you that. If Do you see any publishers, whether they're big, whether they're mid-sized, whether they're contemporary to Falstaff, what publishers do you see 
around you that you think are doing a really good job because you know we've we're talking shit about new york here i i do want to stop for a second and if we can highlight some good that someone's sure. doing up here or doing someplace else like you know i think that's important too apex yeah um jason sizemore at apex is a great human he takes care of his authors and they produce an exquisite product yes, um jason I will almost certainly not ever publish for Apex because they work in a much more literary style and I tend to write more pulpy fiction. Mm -hmm. But Jason and I have been friends, friendly acquaintances, whatever, professional friends for better than a decade. And I've had nothing but respect for him and have not ever heard anyone have an unpleasant view of him um john lawson at raw dog screaming press there are very few horror focused presses that i consider reputable and john runs one of them yeah and they publish good work and he spends a lot of his time teaching and not just teaching his authors but teaching outside of his outside of his authors um those are the those are two that leap to mind they're both a little more established than falstaff mm -hmm. they have been around a bit longer um don't know who's doing it right in new york because i don't know who's up there i don't know right. who's doing what and like i said it's it's not it's not that i don't care about okay part of it is that i don't care about new yeah. york publishing but spending my time focusing on new york publishing means i'm not focusing on the things i can actually do right so those are two that leap to mind as places i would happily publish with if the opportunity presented itself obviously bellbridge who publishes yeah. the black knight chronicles for me they've been fantastic to work with so much of what i know about editing a novel i learned from deb dixon and baby writers, every single one of them needs a copy of Goal, Motivation, and Conflict on their shelf. That's her book on writing, and it's yeah. fantastic. So there's three. Um, there's plenty of ethical people out there. Um, Rachel Brune from Crone Girls is mm -hmm. lovely. She's writing for me as well. She's also going to head up a new imprint for us. Uh, oh, very hey, cool. I'll give you a scoop, bud. Um, yeah. Haven't announced this anywhere, but we are going to be launching a horror imprint in 2023 called Falstaff Dread. And Fantastic. Rachel is going to head that up for us. So to just to update so there's falstaff the main falstaff line there's falstaff crust which is the romance line under lucy blue mm -hmm. um i believe that there's falstaff mystery falstaff sleuth falstaff sleuth thank you um yep. because that was introduced at con caroline this past year yep. um and now there's going to be falstaff um dread dread yeah so when you look at all these different imprints and a lot of publishers, especially at the small and mid-size, go to this kind of imprint model when they want to expand. What is the strength of doing that? And why, why would you go that way instead of just kind of continuing from the main Falstaff line? Because... Which had already, I, I do have to mention, had already previously covered things yeah. like horror. And done some romance and done some mystery. Yes, correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because Falstaff Books is currently inextricably linked to John Hartness. Right. I own the company. I am the vision for the company. 
I want Falstaff Crush to be Lucy's vision. I want Falstaff Dread to be Rachel's vision. I want those pieces, I want those people to have ownership of those pieces so that they will be heavily invested in the success and quality and so that I can diversify the company and make the company stronger than just me. Right. Because it can't survive without other people owning a piece of it and carrying it forward. Absolutely. So, so yeah, it's about spreading it around. I have one more business question and then I have some real fun questions to end on. Sure. Um, what are you working on right now besides the high fantasy? Uh, like what's next for you? I, and are you planning out two years in advance, five years in advance? What, oh, God, what, no. what, what, what does John Hartness have in front of him? I'm doing revisions on, or I'm getting ready to start revising the second novella in Bubba season six. So that should actually, that'll drop this year. I'm going to, I'm starting to revise a comedy thriller with zero supernatural elements called Identity Theft, featuring, uh, it's kind of like an updated Thelma and Louise, only way drunker. Oh, yeah. I, I think you've mentioned this previously. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I've talked about it from time to time. It's, it came from a, a set of circumstances where someone hacked my wife's debit card number from walmart's from walmart.com and ordered sub sandwiches to be delivered to the clubhouse of a housing development in winter park florida (laughs) i know this because i got the email confirmation (laughs) yeah like did did they at least order from a did they order from a good ah no, oh. and it was extra mayo. It was like the it was like the oh. most tasteless white person subs in the world. Mm. I was like, God, you people mm. put raisins in your potato salad. Um, so those are two things that I'm working on. Then I'm going to I would like to finish up this um I call it it's currently called Unforgiven, which won't be the title when i finish with it but that's shorter than high fantasy seven samurai right um next year i'll be writing harker nine and ten i'll Mm -hmm. be writing the other two bubba books and i'll be writing the ninth and final black knight chronicles i have a i have a pair of thrillers that i have started one of them I've made some pretty decent progress on. Um, that's one that I've been noodling around for a long time. And one is inspired by um, by the novel Chiefs, mm. which is a multi-generational police procedural small town murder mystery. So that's um, that's something that I'm also that I'm just starting on. So I'm I'm beginning to branch out genre-wise into some things that are not science fiction and fantasy. We'll see if they find any success, but I'm enjoying writing them. Yeah. But it's time to get back to Harker. I haven't published a Harker book this year. Right. And that's not good for my wallet, but I I feel like to write this ninth book, I needed I needed time and I needed to spend a few days in Mantio where I'm setting the book so that I could be I so that I could be better, so that I could write it better. Right. So F- fantastic. 
Yeah. So thank you for joining me for pondering the orb. I have some really fun questions because we talk about more than just the business. All right. Um, when you look at the state of pro wrestling, which, you know, you and I share this fandom and we've been sharing this fandom our entire lives. Yep. Um, what do you like? Right. Who do you like right now? And what do you not like? I'm a big AEW mark. Yeah. I'm a yeah, big AEW too. mark. I am way more interested in WWE product right now than I have been in several years as mm -hmm. I sit here wearing my Shinsuke Nakamura t-shirt. <laughs> He's finally getting the push, John. He's finally getting the push. I think that Sami Zayn is doing some of the best character work of his career. Amen. I think um, Brian Danielson is... Um, I think he still might be the best wrestler on the planet right now. Um, I think Sammy Guevara and Andrade El Idolo are idiots and need to shut the fuck up and get to work. Yeah. Daniel Garcia in AEW is a license to print money for years and years to come. Um, I really want to see uh, Paul White come back from injury because he's become a friend of mine and I want him to nice. continue to succeed. When I, I saw him at an AEW show in Columbia, South Carolina, and you could just feel the happiness radiating off of him in his environment. And everyone loves the acclaim. Yes. We have an openly gay world tag champion male wrestler on a nationally televised wrestling show for the first time in history. And Bones is fantastic in the ring. He is so good. Yeah. So good and so genuine in interviews outside the ring and his work with max caster mm -hmm. is phenomenal the renaissance of billy gunn dude i met him backstage at that show in columbia and i he i just looked at him and said man working in that other place wwe Working in that other place, you just looked like a normal dude. But now that I'm standing here next to you, Jesus Christ, you're here. Yeah. That yeah. dude is massive. Yeah. But you never would have known that in Vince's world because everybody was a giant. But he's doing such great work. And I really hope that Omega and the Bucks and those guys can get their head out of their ass and... I, that, I um, wanted to, I wanted to ask you about that. When you look at getting away from the brawl after all out between Omega, well, between the Omega and the Bucks, the Elite versus CM Punk and apparently Ace Steel, what did you think of CM Punk's run from his return in Chicago up until uh, him winning the title all out from Moxley? Because, you know, it was really built in some ways to look like the quote unquote Michael Jordan run. He's back for, you know, he, to show us how good he really is. And for the most part, I thought the matches were great. I thought some of the storylines were a little weak here and there, but the matches were fantastic. What what do you think about Punk's, you know, one year comeback? Because it seems like this might, might be it for him. One, I hope this is it for him. I don't want to see him again. Okay. I think it's time for Punk to be done. Yeah. I agree that most of the matches were fantastic. But what makes AEW great for a fan is when it's not one person's show. And you've heard me talk about this at conventions where there's one super big writer right. or when i did heroes con and stan lee was there they suck all the air out of the room 
Right. Nobody else is making any money. You put Punk on, and if he's not closing the show, everything after him is playing to half a house. Right. And if he does close the show, it better be a short show. Not because Punk can't go, because he proved that he can. Yeah. But because if your show's more than two hours long and you're building to one guy, well, you need to get there. Yes. Or people are going to be too tired and they're saving their energy for this thing they came to see. Even Danielson didn't have that effect on the whole card yes even omega didn't have that effect the bucks didn't have that effect the bucks could open a show put on an amazing match with ftr or the lucha bros or a pair of broomsticks frankly but they didn't suck all the air out of the room because private party yeah they can make private party look amazing so the Bucks can go 30 minutes with Private Party as the opener, and they haven't killed the room. Yeah. Punk's too big. He kills the room. It's John Cena. It's a Cena or Rock effect. He's that level. And when I thought it was good, what I thought was going to be fantastic was him and MJF. Yeah. The best heel working in the industry. Yes. Not even nobody's in his league right now. Yeah. He's as good as the very best of the Miz, and the Miz could get nuclear heat. He's yeah. almost 1986 Jim Cornette level heat magnet. And I he- I saw Jim Cornette in 1986. <laughs> Was that when people were trying to kill him in the audience still? Uh, yeah, yeah. I didn't, so, for the record. I was so, 13. I, being but yeah. a fan back in the... I have to ask you, being a fan back in those days and hearing pops from that time or heel heat from that time to... I, I think you, you've, you've mentioned before there's been points where you stopped watching. Oh, yeah. Um, but... Comparing the heat or babyface heat or the pops to that time to the stuff today, how do you think, as you, in terms of how you perceive pro wrestling as a fan, how big do you think it is today versus what it was back then? From a strict, okay, nothing's going to beat the mid 90s. Yeah. The Monday Night Wars wars era was a golden age for engagement for media saturation across all forms of media it's going to be really hard to touch that and i don't think anybody will for if they do in the next 10 or 15 years it'll be a miracle i thought the second generation of nxt got pretty close uh not even close when you talk You couldn't swing a dead cat without seeing somebody wearing an Austin 316 t-shirt. True. I mean, I'm wearing an NXT t-shirt, but I, you know, it used to be you would, if you were walking through the mall wearing an Austin 316 t-shirt, you had a lot of other people wearing that same shirt. True. Now, what that is, era also did was make it very very difficult to get real heat yes because as soon as the curtain call happened and if you are not a wrestling fan and you have any interest in what we're talking about uh you should google curtain call madison square garden and you'll get the whole rundown on how uh, Shawn michaels triple h Scott Kevin Hall, Nash, Scott Hall, Scott Hall, God rest him, and Kevin Nash oh, it, tried to kill uh, the business. The, uh, the kid was out there too. Um, X Pac, one, two, three, yeah. kid. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
But when they killed Kayfabe and Hall and Nash jumped ship and came in as the cool heels, there weren't heels that you hated for a long time after that, except when Hulk Hogan made a heel turn. Right. That got nuclear heat. Right. But that was because Hulk Hogan wiped his ass with everybody's childhood. Yes. And it was a thing of Fantastic. beauty. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Thing of beauty. Yeah. But it's only been in the past 10 years that we've been able to see anybody get real heat again. Mm-hmm. The Miz managed because he's yeah. just got such a punchable face. My God. Just but, to look at him, you want to slap him. And but, but, but nothing to MJF. Nothing to MJF. And you know why? It's very easy to lock in on why Maxwell Jacob Friedman has that nuclear heat. Find him out of character ever. I exactly. dare you. Yeah. Doesn't break cave doesn't break his own kayfabe. Right. Never. There's yeah. even on YouTube, there's a there's a Maxwell Jacob Friedman documentary that's yeah. in kayfabe. The whole yes. thing. It's great. Yes, it's fantastic. I mean, and he has taught, he has been. The other thing is, he probably is a bit of a douche. So he just amps it up to 11. Right. And people hate his guts. So uh, another pro wrestling question. Yeah. Let's put Roman Reigns to the side. It's very obvious that Roman has proven how good he is yes. and how, you know, at one point there was this f- kind of fan sentiment that Vince was pushing Roman and Roman wasn't as good as Roman was. It was just Vince pushing him. I think we now all see that like Roman is as good as Roman is. My I question, think when, however, I think when oh, we all thought that we were right, it just took us a while to accept that he was steadily improving. Right. Because he Absolutely. was a mediocre performer who was getting shoved down our throats for a while. Yeah. But then he got really good. Oh, yeah. Especially when he won the IC title and was defend. Remember when Brock would win the world title and then disappear for six months? So they had to put the IC belt on Roman. Roman worked his ass off and became such a great worker during that time. But to my question, um, and it's good that you bring up being an AEW mark because I'm a gigantic mark of this next man that I'm mentioning but I want to put him in contrast and comparison to his uh, brother in the shield. Remember Romans to the side. Who do you think has become more of an impressive performer now that the shield has been broken up for a good number of years, John Moxley, the current AEW world champion, who I think is literally one of the most fantastic characters we've seen since he left the WWE and has remained a great character or Seth Rollins, who, I would argue if there is an equivalent to Heath Ledger in terms of being that great of an actor on screen, it's Seth Rollins. Seth Rollins has tapped into something in the last few years, whether it's this cruelty or this maniacal nature, he he's found something in himself to truly be a bad guy to the level of, you know, you love to hate him, but when you hate him, you really hate him. So if you have to compare the two, who do you think's, the most improved or or the best out of the pair? I think that Rollins, I believe, has shown more growth as a performer, both in the ring and on the mic. Moxley is still getting better. Mm, I yeah. believe Moxley has a higher ceiling I believe Rollins is better today Ah. because Moxley won there. As soon as he left WWE, he had to remember who John Moxley was. Right. Because he had been Dean Ambrose and then he had been neutered Dean Ambrose. And then for a few minutes he was Bane. Right. But then he had to remember who John Moxley was. Then he had to go get sober. Right. So take out, and then we spent a year with no audiences. And during that time, um, 
Rollins is at home hanging out, theory crafting, promos, and talking business with one of the finest female performers in the industry who he's married to. And Moxley yeah. is at home talk, theory crafting promos and talking to his wife, who is also brilliant at what she does, but she's not an in-ring performer. Right. So while Renee Paquette is a fantastic wrestling journalist, she cannot help Moxley grow in the same ways that Becky Lynch can help Rollins grow. Right. And I believe that I believe that that means that Moxley has more headroom. You know, I often compare him. I, I started comparing him at the beginning of his AEW run. I was like, this guy's the next Steve Austin. Like, literally, he has that kind of swagger. He has that kind of attitude. There's There was a fan heat building behind him that felt Austin-esque. But I have to say, you know, years into his career now as the AEW world champion, he really feels a lot like Terry Funk. And, you know, you Ooh, growing yeah. up and actually seeing Terry Funk, um, you know, how popular was Terry Funk in his heyday? And how close does John Moxley come to him in terms of just, you know, there's a real folk hero kind of heat building up around Moxley that Terry Funk has had throughout his career. See, when Funk was on top, was before I was really paying attention. Right. When I when I got into watching wrestling in the early to mid 80s, Funk's money was coming from Japan. Right. Where I didn't get any of that broadcast. So I and that audience reacts differently culturally than an American audience. So where I'll tell you who I think Moxley is not could be is moxley's a magnum ta who never crashed his car Ooh, it's interesting you say that because i i feel sometimes that hangman adam page has a lot of what magnum ta had as well yes. also true except that page is page has less kayfabe in him yeah you can see the middle school teacher in adam page on the mic um mm -hmm. or high school or whatever but yeah. when he was away from the ring or when he was working indies i mean the man was a public school teacher yes and, and you can see how he would you can see how he would buy a kid a new ice cream cone if a kid dropped one on the street in front of him. Right. But Magnum TA, you knew that he would just beat an, beat an ass if it yeah. needed to be beat. There was always a simmering... Magnum was not the guy you wanted hanging out to, he wasn't the party dude. Now, I don't know anything about him in real life. I did not, have not ever met the man, despite living in the same city as him for pushing 30 years. Right. I, I need to work on that. But <clears throat> his persona was always rough and tumble ready to go um not as angry as mox's persona but that same level of okay if i if i'm sitting at a in a bar and a brawl breaks out and i get to pick one aew person to be standing next to me and the answer is not paul white who i will just hide behind or Mark Henry, who is also massive and can shield many, many things. 
and may still legitimately be the strongest man. There's like rumors backstage that he still does these incredible lifts sometimes for people. Like he he's scary curls. strong still. Yeah. He his his dumbbell curl is more than my highest bench press. Yeah. Now, you can look at my spaghetti arms and tell that my bench press is not impre- is not going to be very impressive, but he curls over a hundred pounds in each hand. Yeah. That's insane. And standing between him and Paul White, I'm six foot one. Yeah. At the time, I weighed 350 pounds, and I looked tiny. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if if I'm in a if I'm in a bar and a fight breaks out, and I can pick John Moxley or Adam Page, I want Moxley because Adam Page is going to try and talk people down and be the straight up good guy and john moxley's gonna break off a, the neck of a beer bottle and go straight at some motherfucker right so I'll, and if i'm stuck and if i'm stuck somewhere where people are throwing throwing hands I'll, the guy the guy next to me i want to be haku level mean yeah and crazy too um yeah one more wrestling question when it comes to women's wrestling right now Whose mm-hmm. product do you like the most? Do you like AEWs or WWE? Because there's a real debate in terms of like, honestly, the quality of both. I honestly can't answer that because I haven't watched a WWE women's wrestling match since they jobbed Bianca Belair to Becky Lynch in 20 seconds. Oh, they fixed that. They fixed that. They'll never fix that. Oh no, they fit, man. You need to see if you can find a high, I will find a highlight for you of it cut up on YouTube. Yeah. But like the feud that Bianca and Becky had leading up to SummerSlam, where Becky literally lost her goddamn mind every time she lost to Bianca, it was amazing. Okay. Um, and it actually fixed everything that they did with it. And it got Becky over okay. as a baby face again. It, they, they, um, they face turned her at the end of the match out of nowhere. And then huh. Bianca is of course, bigger than ever. I would argue that Bianca is truly like Bianca is probably the next big international star in terms of wrestling. She just needs to find like that Dwayne, the rock Johnson moment. She needs to either find a movie or a show or just that moment. She is a license to print money. She yes. is one of the finest performers of any gender in the industry. And I was so offended when they jobbed her out to returning Becky Lynch. I mean, I didn't watch any WWE product for over a year. Yeah. And we were stuck at home. (laughs) Right. So I have just gotten back to where I'm thinking about following NXT again now that they're now that Triple H is running creative and things may suck less. I have to say, I think that you would really love NXT. I think you would really love SmackDown. The stuff they're doing on SmackDown right now is really, really good. I'm probably I'm at a con this weekend so i won't get to see it live but i will probably watch this friday's smackdown when i get home because they brought wyatt back yes so and he's apparently he's going to be on smackdown this week so i'm pretty interested because they find they've corrected that tragic error i i I thought i had only one more wrestling question (laughs) left but then there's another one um you know, you and I used to drive around the truck between cons talking about Vince and the impact Vince had on writing and on wrestling and just on the way that we perceive storytelling. You know, Vince has had a very uh, tumultuous downfall, to say the least. <laughs> um, sure. But what do you think was the upside of Vince McMahon as the booker for WWE? And what do you think was the biggest downside of it? 
I mean, obviously the stuff that was happening backstage with the female talent, but in terms of the actual like creative product itself, what did you like about Vince and what did you think, you know, what, what did you hate about him? If there was anything. Ignoring the fact that there are plenty of reports that he's a garbage human being. Yes. Because I don't know. I've never met the man and I have never asked any of the people that I know who did some work for him. Um, I think that he had an understanding of how to catch lightning in a bottle. Mm. I think that he could respond to an event, to a character, to a promo, and pivot and take advantage of it incredibly well right when let's take the bret hart thing um great example yeah he took a an incredibly negative event i mean an event that was so fraught with emotion that you had well one that a wrestler decked the owner of the company, spit in his face on live television, and punched him in the dressing room. Mm -hmm. You had other wrestlers taping up their fists, thinking that they were going to have to beat ass in the back. You had Mick Foley refusing to go to work the next day. Yeah. And with one promo Vince created the greatest villain of the 20th century in professional wrestling himself mm -hmm. when he sat there in front of a camera and said I didn't screw Brett Brett screwed Brett that promo was not the gold. Yeah. Taking that and making him realizing that the that all of the fans hated his guts and being willing to lean into that. Mm -hmm. That was his genius. A someone who could not take advantage of how something resonated with a crowd wouldn't have taken a mildly or maybe more than mildly blasphemous promo from Steve Austin and turn it into one of the gr biggest selling pieces of wrestling merchandise in history. Yeah. And if there's one thing I hated about him, it's that he listened to sycophants too often. Yeah. Same thing about Eric Bischoff. Yeah. It's the same thing about Jeff Jarrett or Dixie yeah. Carter or whoever was running. When the inmates the are running the asylum, then it's truly crazy. Absolutely. When, when Nash and Hall and Shawn Michaels and Triple H were able to torpedo people's careers just because they had Vince's ear, that's not right. That's right. and it's dumb. When th when some of those same guys were able to do it in WCW stupid right and ditto tna when mm -hmm. and part of it comes from similar to our conversations about publishing people who are in the business too long or too invested in the business as opposed to paying attention to how to run a business right so um, 
before we go, what book are you listening to right now? And what music are you listening to right now that you really enjoy? I drive a lot less now. So I listen to a lot less. I listen to a lot less on audio and I've been hip deep in edits. So I haven't been doing much pleasure reading. I've been I've been eyeballs deep in a bunch of Jennifer Estep novels. Mm -hmm. uh, she has a trilogy. Bright Blaze of Magic is one of the three, and I don't know if it's the first or the third, but I really enjoy those. And her um, Capture the Crown is one in one of her high fantasy series. I really enjoy that series. Naomi Novik just released the third book in her Scholomancy or Scholomancer series it's her um it's her magic university mm -hmm. series and i loved the first two and i'm really looking forward to reading the next one but i'm waiting for the ebook not to cost 14 dollars. right um i'm reading it i've been reading a ton of jonathan mayberry because he's amazing yeah and because he put me in one of his anthologies, so I felt like I needed to read more Joe Ledger to be able to write the character. Right. And musically, um, I'll tell you, that's something that has really been hurt by my career change. Because oh, okay. since I'm not driving 20 or 30,000 miles a year anymore, I don't have satellite radio and that's how I discovered a lot of new music was on XM. So I'm listening to the same stuff I've listened to forever. When I'm chilling out, I listen to Sarah McLachlan, the Indigo Girls, Vienna Tang, Lindsey Sterling. I like that. Um, if I'm writing a fight scene, I have a fight scene playlist that includes a fair chunk of Rob Zombie. Nice. Um, you know, and a lot of bluegrass, a lot of folky Americana stuff. The Avett Brothers, Sam Bush, John Prine, God rest him, John Hyatt, um, those guys. Dolly Parton is a queen. Yeah. So, so hey, yeah. I have a, I have yeah. a question. Um, I, I st recently started listening to Dolly Parton because I'm a big Orville fan and they made a big deal about her on the Orville for okay. season three. Um, sure. First of all, immaculate voice and an amazing songwriter. Just, you know, yeah. uh, it, it's one of those things I think you just discover when you finally pick her up and, and really start enjoying her music. But when you think of um, country music now, and what you grew up with and what's being played, what do you like and what don't you like? So I have no idea what's on the radio. Right. Because I don't listen to the radio. Um, right. What I like, I like Sturgill Simpson. Yeah. I like, I like Jamie Johnson. I like Chris Stapleton. Rihanna Giddings is amazing. Um, Marin Morris and the High Women. Jason Isbell is one of the best songwriters working today. I'm still really happy to go back to some old Billy Joe Shaver or Waylon Jennings, any of that mm -hmm. older stuff. But yeah, there's there's good country music out there. Um, I don't know how much of it gets through to country music radio because like i said i don't listen yeah um justin timberlake even did a really good country song well T timberlake is so talented that like makes that, kind of want to vomit doesn't it yeah it's kind of sickening i'm um, like damn dude you shouldn't be able you shouldn't be that pretty and be able to sing and dance and and act in movies fuck you sir <laughs> i know right leave something um, for the rest of us absolutely john yo thank you so much for being on pondering the orb and um you know i i had a question for you about uh mentoring writers but the the thing i wanted to end on is is this uh 
you've always been a big mentor to, to me and early on in my career. And I think early on in our relationship, I think I bugged you a lot by asking you to constantly like teach me things. And, and what I realized later on is that it's the stuff that you made me do without having to go and actually teach me hands-on that taught me more. Um, for example, I'm, I'm working on a trilogy for fall staff called uh, the trials of St. Patrick, though that will probably change in the name before we get there. Yes, um, it will. <laughs> um, but you have taught me so many important things. Like you made me go back and rewrite the entire first book. And if someone hadn't made me do that, I wouldn't have been able to learn as much as I had about myself as an author and grow and develop into something better. So I just wanted to say, you know, not only thank you for coming on Pondering the Orb, but thank you for mentor mentoring me in the ways that I never expected. And thank you for constantly putting your belief in me and putting stock in me and giving me another shot, sir. Thank you so much. You're very welcome, my friend. I'm I'm glad that it's uh i'm glad that it's working out for both yeah, of us absolutely um, i i always it's always a little awkward when someone thanks you for mentoring them especially because my style of mentoring isn't much of okay go do this and do this this way it's more okay come with me yeah. watch everything I do, yeah. ask questions about anything that doesn't make sense, and then let's talk about what just went down, and I'll tell you what I'm thinking, because that's more of how I learn things, so it's how I teach people when right. I teach, as opposed to presenting something as this is the way to do it, because I never... I don't ever want to teach somebody how to write a book. Right. I've never felt like I'm qualified to teach anyone how to write a book. I can tell you how I write books. Yeah. But I can teach someone how to be a writer. Yes. And that's the important thing. Uh, I, I want to leave on that because if if anything, you taught me how to not only be a professional in this business, but you also taught me how to be an author in terms of like how I handled myself, how I looked at my own work and how I went about the process. You made me actually care about the process. And, you know, if anything I can thank you for, I, I want to thank you for that among many other things, but especially for that. Um, You're very well. friend. Process is uh, everything. I, process I, I, is everything and systems. Yeah. If you can understand the system that someone is operating within or how a system works, then you can either thrive within that system or you can work to subvert that system. Right. But first you have to understand the system and the process. Absolutely. John, thank you so much. Um, I hope you will come back later Absolutely. on some other time but thank you so much for being on pondering the orb and i'll see you again soon my friend all right bud i will talk to you soon We beseech the ever night with these final words. Happy Halloween, happy Samhain, and happy All Saints Day. Also, today is my mother's birthday. Happy birthday, Mama. Underneath all this paint, this ridiculous outfit, before my books, and before this orb, is a very happy child who's proud to be your son. I love you, and happy birthday. Thank you all so much for joining me for this special episode of Pondering the Orb. I hope to see you all again soon. Safe journeys.
My throat. My throat, my throat, my throat. <laughs>